Okay, yes, we're starting. We're live. You could start the webcast. Thank you very much. Okay, I can confirm we're live. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Leader. I just need to start off the proceedings um, by saying that, first of all, we have as I understand it, sufficient members in attendance. Uh, we have two deputies in the meeting and are able to hear and see what is being said. Prior to the formal start, we will try to alert members when they're admitted. And I understand they have been admitted now. Is that right, uh, uh, Kevin? Yes, I can confirm that the deputation, the deputies are in the meeting um, ready for when you call them to speak. Please. Thank you very much. Um, when you speak, can you clearly state who you are and can you also keep your microphones off when you're not speaking and use the normal hand uh, raising facility on Teams if you want to speak? Um, and I ought to start by saying that this meeting is being streamed and will also be available for repeated viewing. I'll begin by naming the members who are in attendance for the public record during the meeting, if any member wishes to speak, they should indicate as I've indicated to you just now. Um, and at this meeting, as far as I can see, I'll read out the cabinet members, obviously not everybody else. Myself, Councillor Keith Manns, the Deputy uh, 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 Leader, Councillor Rob Humby, uh, Councillor Ros Chad, Councillor Liz Fairhouse, Councillor Judith Godowski, uh, uh, Councillor Edward Heron, Councillor Edward Joy, Councillor Steve Reed, Councillor Patricia Stallard, and Councillor Sean Woodward. Have I missed anybody out? Good. Right, first of all, can I have any apologies for absence? And I presume there aren't any, but just in case. No apologies, thank you. Declarations of interest. Could I have any declarations of interest, please? <coughs> Uh, Councillor Woodward. Yes, th thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to declare an interest in the final item, which is the one that relates to the M27 Junction 10. I have a personal interest because I'm the leader of Fairham Borough Council, which is the planning authority. And what I realise that a personal interest allows me to uh, both speak, discuss and vote on the item. Uh, my view is, and I've done this previously with some personal interest that I would uh, speak, see whether any members have any questions they would like to ask me in that uh, role in which I declared an interest. And then I would depart the meeting as it's the problem and uh, go and watch it on YouTube. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. Any other uh, declarations of interest at all? Chairman, Councillor Edward Heron, um, yes. I'd like to declare a personal interest in item 11, the Waterside Vision as the portfolio holder for planning and infrastructure at New Forest District Council. Uh, the level of my interest is such that I feel quite comfortable remaining speaking and voting. Thank you, Councillor Heron. Uh, moving on, if there are no more declarations of interest, the minutes of the previous meeting, these have all been circulated in the statutory period of time everyone's had a chance to read them i hope can i have any comments on the meeting and the minutes themselves before i uh, electronically sign them you're all happy with the minutes are you if you're not put your hand up if you are you don't need to do anything okay i will sign those minutes as a true indication of our last meeting in, I think it was July, wasn't it? Um, just before we come to deputations, I'd also like to welcome Councillor Keith House. Um, and I understand, Councillor House, you'd like to speak on items six, seven, and 10. Um, and if I forget to call you, I'm certain you'll make your voice known uh, before those particular items get considered. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, fine. Can I now move to the deputations? Um, and I think I'm right in saying, uh, Kevin, we've got the, 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 the time is 10 minutes and the two deputation deputies are Anne Stevenson and Sarah Gooding. 
and as I say, you can share those that time that's allocated to you both in any way you like. So over uh, to you. Leader, sorry, just to interrupt, they're separate deputations, so they, they receive 10 minutes oh, each. So I, I apologise. In that case, that we'll start that if, and Stevenson could give a give, uh, 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 speech to the uh, Cabinet first. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for letting me give this deputation. Uh, can I just check everyone can hear me? Yes, I think uh, you're loud and clear. Thank you. Um, so my name is Anne Stevenson and I live in Fareham. Um, I belong to the local Friends of the Earth group in Fareham. Um, but I'm speaking today as a representative of Hampshire Climate Action Network or HCAN, which brings together people from community groups across the county to learn from each other and um, to uh, speak with a common voice. Uh, the points I'm going to make have been produced as a result of um, a collaboration of all those involved. So I'm going to be reading from my notes, uh, which I'm hoping you will have received prior to the meeting. Uh, so I'm just going to switch to uh, a screen so I can just read them straight off the screen. Um, so I'd like to make two points, uh, two main points. And the first point I'd like to make is about how local communities can play their role. Uh, and the second is about the Hampshire Climate Action Plan itself and how it works as a plan. So firstly, we are very appreciative, appreciative um, of the enormous amount of work that's gone into preparing the papers and identifying so much that can be done to create a zero carbon Hampshire. So congratulations to all those involved and thank you very much. Um, the main thing we want to say is that we want to help um, in this process, which we feel that we can do by acting as a bridge between the county council and local people who care about climate change. We also have members with years of professional expertise in different aspects of low carbon economy who are keen to offer their help and expertise. And so our suggestions are to improve the plan and not to undermine it. With that in mind, we are disappointed at the officer's responses to the ideas from the community, which are listed in Appendix 3, which largely resulted from the experts forum, um, which we attended. Sometimes the response that was given was that the idea had already been done or it will be looked at, and in which case we think that should be in the action plan, but sadly it isn't. And unless the idea is listed in the action plan, we feel it's not going to happen. So please, can you tell officers to add those things to the list? In many cases, the officer response is that the idea won't be taken up. And to be honest, that reads to us as if the request for ideas is just for show and the suggestions just haven't really been taken seriously. If something won't be done, I think we deserve an explanation an explanation that's true and coherent and not something that misses the point. Uh, and I'd just like to give you a quote from Sarah Gooding from Winac. She said, people must feel there's real engagement so they see the everyday impact of the decisions, are, that the everyday impact of the decisions are cognizant of their suggestions. So they're made to feel they can make a difference by being involved. This requires a two-way participative involvement in a similar style to that in the Innovation in Democracy programme. And the success of the plan requires involvement by and from all communities. Uh, and there's a link to the government publication, the Innovation in Democracy programme that you receive. Other ideas I'd like to um, just cover is, we would definitely like to see more about skills development, especially for retrofitting buildings, energy efficient building, and renewable energy, pro, uh, in renewable energy trades. As you know, there's a government fund, there is government funding available for a skills development programme, and we wondered whether the County Council is looking at applying, whether in its own name or in partnership with local FE colleges or businesses. Transport is such a large proportion of Hampshire's emissions, we feel more needs to be added, especially at this stage. We think there's disappointingly little on rethinking transport and engaging positively in the government's agenda on transport decarbonisation, despite all their open invitations. Developing an analysis of mobile share and how it must change to reduce emissions 
as a prerequisite for effective action. And we feel the officers' responses to suggestions show in in insufficient understanding of how much needs to be done and of why many of the suggestions that have been made need to be adopted and developed. There needs to be more recognition of the strategic role that public transport must play and more innovative proposals on developing rail and bus services. A coherent approach to the decarbonisation of freight distribution has been ignored and that's going to be crucial. Active transport proposals need to go far beyond the current emergency schemes. A new strategic direction will need to go beyond local transport plan 4, however important LPT4 is. So that's the first point. Uh, and my second point is about the action plan as it stands as a plan. So if I promised my family a cake, I wouldn't arrive with flour, sugar, butter and eggs. However much time and effort I'd put into growing, the wheat, grinding into flour, looking after chickens to lay the eggs, feeding the cows to produce the milk that I made into butter, I wouldn't have a cake with me. So similar, we appreciate all the work that's gone into the many excellent ingredients in these papers, but we feel they aren't yet pulled together into a plan. We understand the plan is a work in progress and a living document that's going to be reviewed, but to even monitor and progress, the, uh, uh, to monitor, but to even be monitored and progress reviewed, you need, to, uh, you need it to, number one, set a timetable and real milestones with outputs and dates. Number two, estimate the cost of each action. Number three, bundle together smaller actions and unbundle big ones. And number four, have a system for carbon accounting. We also feel that the plan is unbalanced. Some rows are very tiny and even trivial actions, while others cover and bundle together a large variety of projects. It should identify and prioritise the actions which will have the most impact and put those which have little impact to the bottom of the list. To do this means we need to see the estimated saving in energy use and carbon emissions for the various actions. For example, 103 rows in Appendix 1 list actions that will cut the carbon footprint of the County Council. 45 rows will cut the carbon footprint of the rest of Hampshire. There are 14 rows that affect both. Yet the County Council's footprint is less than 1% of the entire footprint of the area. So those 103 actions should just be one line in a plan with 99 other lines for actions outside the County Council. Finally, we want to give you our congratulations. The County Council is on target to reduce its own emissions to zero by 2035, well ahead of the 2050 target. However, this makes it even more important to put energy into those things where the County Council can lead, even though it can't instruct. And that means front-loading appropriate wider emission, re action, wider emission reduction actions over this decade to ensure similar vital success alongside that achieved for County Council business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, and I'm sure that my deputy, who has overall responsibility for the environment, together with Councillor Warwick, will have listened carefully to the points you make, particularly in relation to our action plan. Could I now ask Sarah Gooding to um, speak to us? Sarah? Good morning. Kevin. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Sorry and about I'll that. See you as well. Excellent. <laughs> there will be a little bit of overlap between what Anne has just said to you and what I'm going to say, understandably, as we're talking on the same subject. My name's Sarah Gooding. I'm speaking today on behalf of Winchester Action on Climate Change, uh, where I'm shortly going to become the Treasurer. I've lived in Hampshire for 22 years and brought my children up here and in my professional life I'm a director of a property estate in London. But today I'm here to talk to you about the action plan 2020-2025. Um, 
Winak has previously submitted a briefing um, on the actual strategy, so I'm not going to go into detail about any of the points in the action plan. This is more about the overall structure and the way that it's been um, set out and how we feel it could be improved. Firstly, as, as Anne has already said, there is very, there's a lot here for Hampshire County Council and its officers to be very proud of. It's so clear how much work is going into this and how much priority is being given to it. And for that, we're very grateful and our thanks to everyone involved. We're delighted to see that there is such a huge range of proposed activities within the action plan. Um, and it will take a wide range of projects for us to achieve these targets and will require so much collaboration across the county and wider still. The stakeholder event on the 6th of August was very well attended and generated so much energy and so many ideas and wide ranging project suggestions for, for officers to evaluate. And that was a really positive event. So thank you for that too. We all know there's a lot to do and we, re and we recognize within the action plan that there's very much a sense of urgency. And that's of course so important for us to, to get to where we need to be. Today is significant for you all because you're considering the action plan without which the, the strategy is meaningless. How you set out to achieve the targets is crucial to the success of the strategy and must be approached carefully. So I wanted really to make three key points. My first point, and this might sound strange, but I'm asking you, please do not approve this action plan yet. Let me explain. It would be premature to approve the action plan because it hasn't really yet been integrated into the framework for strategic programmes. Once that work has been done, it'll be clearer for you to understand whether the, there are sufficient work streams and emissions reduction assessments to achieve the aims. At the moment, by officers' own admission, this is not the case. The report warns you that the actions listed will not get you to your targets by 2050. A great deal of new significant areas for activity are proposed within the framework, which should help you to meet the targets set, but it only indicates these in the broadest terms. None of this has been quantified in the plan and the carbon emissions are not identified either. Clearly, a lot more work needs to be done before you can say that you have a coherent plan to achieve your targets by 2050. I'm not going to argue here about whether 2050 is the right date, but certainly after 2050 is definitely too late. My second point is that it isn't really an action plan at all, but a list. And I think um, Anne had a really nice... Uh, <laughs> Uh, idea about a cake and ingredients. Um, it requires much more work in order to link it to the strategy, to quantify the impacts of emissions, to give costs, to set timetables and to identify priorities. There are a lot of ideas, lots of good thinking, lots of effort put into consulting people and gathering views, but crucially it has not yet turned into a plan which you can implement and measure against. Please could you ask officers to come back with a plan that clearly shows you how you're going to meet the targets set out in the climate change strategy, but also which allows you to estimate your saving and energy use in carbon emissions and prioritises actions with the most impact, putting those which have little impact to the bottom of the list. It needs to set a timetable and the milestones included within it need to have proper outputs and dates. And of course it needs all to be costed and I'm preaching to the converted, you all understand that. My third point is that we are really quite disappointed at the reaction to the ideas from the community listed in Appendix 3. As I said earlier, the day, the morning that we spent uh, in the consultative forum was excellent and, and came up with a lot of very far reaching and interesting ideas. And we were led to believe that these would be evaluated. We feel that really within the within schedule appendix three there's no clear evaluation of any of the ideas it's it's merely an officer's response to each of the ideas and that they need more careful appraisal often it feels as if there's a failure fundamental failure to understand what it is that's being suggested or that perhaps it's just being pushed in the box of too difficult people will be loath to share ideas unless it's made clear that their suggestions are going to be taken seriously. And that would be a terrible shame because there are a lot of people within Hampshire who really can help you to achieve your aims. 
as presented, Appendix 3 is unclear, inadequate, and the suggestions given by stakeholders have not been given the attention they deserve. So we would ask you to ask officers to revisit this and to come back with some clearer assessments of the ideas presented. Thank you all for your time today and for your active commitment to responding with urgency to the challenges we all face in the climate emergency. Thank you very much, Sarah. As I said to, uh, I said earlier, um, my deputy who's in overall charge of the environment will certainly take on board the points you make. I think the, the only point I would make is this is the start of a journey. Um, I was very keen that we made a start and clearly this is not in any way complete. We will need to do a lot more work, we acknowledge that. And I've certainly taken on board the points that you've made about the ideas that have come from outside the council and how those can be incorporated in our plan. So as I say, this is a work in progress. This is a journey we're on. And I think at least we're all on the same road. Perhaps we may argue about speed with the <laughs> down that road, but that's part and parcel of the, uh, the situation we're in. So thank you very, both of you, thank you very much. Thank you. Let us move on. And we come to item six now, a progress report of the County Council's response to COVID-19. Can I start by asking Councillor House for his um, comments before we start actually looking at the proposals themselves? Yes, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I just see you've skipped over Chairman's announcements, but I guess that means you oh. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I always do that. I did it before, didn't I? <laughs> we'll have those after you. We'll have those. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, you, you can make your comments on uh, item six. I'll do my chairman's announcements and then we'll get, get into the topic itself. OK, I'm just, just checking you're still there, chairman. <laughs> I am, yes. That's, that's good. It's very easy, particularly with these meetings, to get things out of sequence and, uh, and the flow does not work. Um, so thank you, chairman. Um, this is, uh, as usual, a comprehensive report, and I very much welcome it uh, from, from our staff. And I think it does show the, the, the depth and detail uh, of the responses that the County Council has had to work through over the course of these very challenging and difficult last six months. And it's worth, again, just putting on record my support and the Liberal Democrat Group's support uh, for everything the County Council has, has done, the work of our staff and our colleagues across the county, uh, the public sector as a whole, uh, still has a remarkable record of success uh, uh, over the course of the last few months. Uh, going the extra mile, um, you can run through all of, all of the standard lines, but it's it's absolutely true. And I, I just do hope that when we finally do emerge from uh, the difficult scenario that we're in, uh, there'll be some pause and reflection about the value of the public sector uh, for, for keeping our country going and keeping our, our county going. There's a couple of references in the report, Chairman, which I think probably I think it's probably just the speed at which things have to be written these days that are written in the future tense, talking about July and August. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether the flow was quite right in a few places, but uh, uh, I think that's probably just a, just a matter of proofreading. I think the critical point to me now is that for for most cases, we ought to be as close to business as usual as possible, and we largely are. Uh, but there are clearly are a few areas where that hasn't been the case, and we just need, do need, I think, to focus on those a little bit. Uh, I raised, as you'll be aware, Chairman, the issue with some of our phone lines that still six months on uh, are not open to the public. I think we're probably close to, to getting those back on the road now, but we're not there yet. Uh, we, I think we ought to reflect at some point about what we could have done better in those areas because many other local authorities managed to, to get their phone systems off, up and running over the course of a weekend or, or shorter. Six months really, really isn't good enough. Whilst I'm still in slightly critical friend mode, Chairman, um, there, there are a number of areas where there have been project delays, uh, where it's just beginning to get a sense that, that, the, that COVID is the excuse for things becoming delays rather than real reasons. Uh, and some of the pro some, some project delays have a significant knock-on uh, to other parts of the public sector, to infrastructure delivery, uh, to delivery of homes, to delivery of other capital projects, uh, or things that really matter in our community. And again, I think we just need to just keep pause and make sure that we're, that we're on top of those. Chairman, the critical point now really is that we need to be looking to the future. I think we probably all recognise uh, that the government eased too fast in some areas, um, the consequence of which we're seeing now with a quarter of the English population in some form of lockdown, uh, and those lockdown areas crawling south down the country 
uh, moving inexorably in our direction. I hope very much that we're able to uh, continue to protect the Hampshire population uh, so that we don't see further restrictions uh, on the way that we operate, the way that we live our lives. But I, I sense, sadly, that we are moving inexorably in that direction, and that's something we'll just have to, to accept. We do need to be consistent uh, with, with our decision making. Um, we broadly have done, uh, but I'll pick up just one example where perhaps we need to, again need to give pause and thought about how we're processing some of these issues. Uh, in, it, one issue which was um, the decision of, of public health at the back end of last week to close fares. Um, I had a good discussion with the chief executive uh, about that because there was a fair due to start in my county division towards the back end of last week. The decision from public health was to close the fair, uh, and yet we, did, yet we then didn't do that. Um, and there may well have been good reasons for that, uh, but if we're, if we're thinking about consistent messages to our community and protecting our community, uh, we need to make sure that we get that right. I certainly had very confused residents, some saying, why haven't you closed the fair? Others saying, we need the fair open because the fair operate, operator needs his income. Chairman, I, I'd like to end this session br briefly with, with, with a sense of hope. Uh, because I do, do think now, six months in, we need to start to project positively about the future. We have been through a very difficult six months. We know the next six months are going to be difficult too. But somewhere, sometime, we're going to emerge from the difficulties we've been in. And we need to make sure that we've got a positive, upbeat community, a positive, upbeat county council uh, that can react uh, and look progressively towards our future. So, Chairman, I think it's a good and helpful report. As always, we can do a bit better. I hope we will continue to resolve to do so because it's in our best interest as a county council uh, to do that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor House. Indeed, although I should have done my opening remarks before your um, uh, comments, actually some of them relate directly to them. So I'll carry on with my Chairman's remarks and then I'll ask the Chief Executive to go through the report in detail and indeed my opening remarks are mainly about the report anyway. I think the first thing I'd say is just to uh, repeat the mantra that I've been repeating quite regularly since the beginning of the, um, the pandemic and that is that our objective is to reduce the spread of the virus. We need to involve everybody both in the public and the private sector in order to achieve that and thirdly we've got to help each other through this crisis. Clearly, the recovery is part of reducing the spread of the virus. If we can do that, it makes the recovery and what happens next much easier. And I fully take on board Councillor House's point about looking beyond the pandemic as to what the new normal would look like. And I can assure him that that work is, is, is going on. Clearly, it's affected by events themselves. But we are going to be in a new norm. I personally think a lot of the home working will continue, that we'll have less people in our offices. But nonetheless, the importance of socialisation, the importance of meeting people in person is, I think, uh, uh, something that we have to bear in mind. So it's a balance about getting it right. Depending upon the jobs that people actually carry out within the council will largely determine the amount of time they actually spend in the office or working at home or indeed in another local location where they have full access to the facilities they need to carry out their job. Um, let me say a word or two about test and trace and particularly the new app. There's no doubt in our, my own mind that we need more tests and more importantly we need the lab capacity to deal with those tests because from a local point of view the best way of stopping the spread of the, uh, of the virus is to ensure you find out where the hotspots are as early as possible. So any lockdowns that have to take place are as local as possible and don't uh, move out into whole towns. It may just be s single buildings. Equally, I'm hopeful that the app will, um, will, will help us do that. Clearly, it's run into the odd teething problem, which is not unusual when it comes to any form of electronic uh, uh, piece of software. Um, but I'm quite convinced that we just have to put more and more pressure on getting tests and actually getting those tests back as quickly as possible. And I'm also conscious of the fact that we may be asked to do more in this area in the future as a local authority, 
And I just hope that the funding to do that will come down to us from central government in the same way as funding was made available to those private organisations that are carrying out a lot of the test and trace activities as we speak. Let me briefly talk about schools. Um, we've got a lot of children back in schools, more than the national average, I'd like to point out, over 90%. And indeed, we're dealing on a daily basis with any queries they have about particular outbreaks in schools. The team at the County Council is working very closely with all schools because the situation varies quite significantly from one school to another so that we can make the most common sense and correct decision as to whether a particular uh, a group of children are sent home or not. Let me move on to the item that um, Councillor House mentioned, and that is festivals. First of all, we did actually decide that the Fairy Festival in the New Forest shouldn't be allowed to go ahead because of the numbers involved, the fact they were coming from all over the country made a difference to that. As regards the fun fair, uh, yes, I, I think it's true to say that had this been on our own land, we would probably have been in a position not to go ahead with it, simply because we would have had the statutory power so to do. But relying upon the government uh, 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 powers that have been given to us in relation to COVID-19, it was very difficult to see how we could use those if we wished to shut down this particular funfair. What I think was important to note in making the decision to allow it to continue was the fact that numbers were very small compared with the festival I just mentioned, amounting to about 200 at any one time. And there was a way of checking people in and checking people out. But we will have to look at all these things in the future. And I'm thinking particularly of Remembrance Services on the 11th of November or that week, and indeed Guy Fawkes Night, uh, Bonfire Night. As to the uh, public health advice we get and how we adapt that advice according to the individual circumstances of a particular activity. As a sort of parting shot, it's very clear that when it comes to spreading the virus, it spreads much more easily in confined indoor spaces than it does outside. And I hope that people will not only take that into account, taking a common sense view about distancing, about washing their hands, and generally accepting the fact that it spreads more easily indoors amongst a number of people than it does outdoors. And as I say, maintaining the distancing. And on those few general comments about the um, uh, um, uh, 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 about the progress of the uh, 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 the pandemic, uh, uh, switching now specifically to item six, and following on from what I've said, I'd like to ask the chief executives to give us a, um, uh, a rundown of what is quite a lengthy and a report that I know changes almost from day to day on the progress of the county's response to COVID-19. Uh, 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 John Coghlan. Uh, thank, thank you, Leader, and also thank you, Councillor House. I'll, I'll try to pick up in my summary of the report um, some of the points that, that you've raised, um, uh, all of which I do understand. So um, this is the latest of what has been a series of comprehensive update reports about the management of the COVID crisis within the County Council. Um, and the first thing I would want to say, which reflects upon some of the discussion you've already had, is that we think that this may need to be the last of its kind, or at least we thought so until recent weeks, when obviously the direction of the pandemic uh, and the nature of national responses changed gear somewhat. Um, but um, it, this may be the last version of an attempt to do an entirely comprehensive COVID update, because I do appreciate it is a complicated uh, and, uh, and, and slightly cumbersome report which does, as you say, Leader, uh, necessarily have to be updated as we go, and therefore does expose some of the errors that I think Councillor House has found, for which my apologies. Um, we will we'll have to see um, how the national and local uh, developments impact upon our ability to keep Cabinet as closely briefed as possible as we go forward about these extraordinary efforts in extraordinary times. And I think one of the features of the report is that we are in a sense, normalising the extraordinary as we go forward because of the, the changes in circumstances that we're working with. Before uh, going into the content of the report in any detail, and I will cover this very summarily, Leader, because I do appreciate it's a long 
paper and I want to allow time for cabinet discussion and to take questions alongside um, corporate management team colleagues who are here to help with questions, including the Director of Public Health. But just to refer you to the report following this one um, on the financial circumstances of the County Council and, that, and the financial implications of managing the virus and managing the crisis. Um, and I won't touch upon those issues here, but obviously the two papers lean into each other very, very closely. And the Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Corporate Resources will be leading that report in a, a few minutes' time. Going into the content of the paper, necessarily the first uh, and critical section of the report is about our public health responsibilities. Uh, they've evolved um, significantly, um, as has the role of the Director of Public Health, which will include, um, I'll mention in just a moment, the, the new duties around what the government called outbreak management and the establishment of the Health Protection Board and the parallel political arrangements of the Outbreak Engagement Board chaired by yourself, leader. Um, we are seeing within the county uh, at the moment an increasing but still relatively low prevalence of the infection rate uh, compared to national averages. And in rough terms, Hampshire as a county as a whole still remains in the critical measure in the region of 10 per, per 100,000 uh, uh, known cases. Um, what I think is extremely interesting, and I mentioned the graph in paragraph uh, 17 in just a moment, is the very, very wide range now nationally of that rate, uh, reaching into two or three hundred, fat hundred per 100,000. So a very, very significant factor of increase against the Hampshire rate. So we're seeing increases they're putting pressure upon our services and systems, including on testing. But you know, we are well at the lower end of what is a, a quite a wide national scale at the moment. We are very proud of the work that's gone, contributed to, to that work, which is explained and described within the section on public health. But um, I do have to make a very strong point to the Cabinet in that regard, that we know that we're also blessed by some forces of geography and demography which have a heavy impact upon the spread of the virus in this area, and that we can't um, take for granted our current position, but must continue to work gainfully and collectively in the messages to the public and in the management of testing and in the management of outbreak control. We introduced into this report the previous version of the report, uh, the graph which is a paragraph 17 uh, leader, and uh, unfortunately, we now see that that graph is relatively prescient in terms of its analysis of the implications for a second wave, which we are now into nationally. Where the graph is less clear, because it can't help in this regard, is the point I was making earlier about the very significant range now that exists nationally in the prevalence of the virus. And put simply, we remain in Hampshire at this stage closer to the light blue line um, in that graph than we do um, in the space between the dark blue and the green lines in terms of the reproduction rate um, uh, of, of, the, of the transmission. Uh, and that's good for the county, but it's something that we need to hold on to very, very carefully. And we may yet be slightly behind the curve, particularly in seeing hospital admissions in regard to um, the, the, the increasing prevalence of the virus at the moment, which is an inevitable implication of the gradual easing of lockdown that we've seen nationally and locally in recent months. There is an issue outlined within the report about the progress of testing. Undoubtedly, testing has increased and improved as a facility of our response to the virus, um, and our oversight of that is critically important. Um, we now have the regional testing centre, which has moved from the Tipner site um, into Southampton Airport in very recent days, and that's positive for that to be so central to the county, as it will become a key dimension of our testing capacity. And we also have coming on stream five, at least five local sites, possibly more in the next few weeks, local testing centres, which will increase capacity and accessibility. But there remains behind the testing story locally, a challenge around access to tests driven by the lab capacity. Um, and we are working with national and regional colleagues to keep pressure upon government that we need the lab capacity to keep pace with the, ex the extension of testing capacity, because otherwise there is a cap on local testing, put simply in my lay terms. The report also talks about the bedding in now of the outbreak control arrangements, which I referred to earlier. 
um, which I think are going well, and I believe we have the right framework in place in the relationship between the more political outbreak control engagement board chaired by yourself, leader, and the health protection board chaired by the director of public health, both arrangements, including relevant partners. I will, if I may, in the context of that, because it's that role which uh, uh, um, governs our responsibility to take decisions about management of outbreaks within the community. And most of that work happens at a relatively low scale, particularly now with the opening of schools. But we were faced with two of our most difficult early decisions last week. We did take the decision to issue a direction to close the fairy festival in the New Forest. As you say, Leader, because of the numbers involved, but also because we were acutely aware that those numbers involved a large amount of traveling into the county from areas of higher prevalence. And it was that importation of potential infection, which, which was the dictating factor amongst several others in our decision to, um, to issue that direction. We did eventually stop short of issuing a direction on the one fun fair in Eastleigh, knowing as we do that there are a number of fun fairs within the area. Um, we did urge the fun fair not to open, but we took the view that we did not have the grounds technically and legally to sustain a direction to close. As you say, Leader, it would have been much easier if it was on our ground and we could have simply said, we're not allowing this event to take place on our premises. But we didn't think we had enough to take the line um, around issuing the direction. That was not least because I have to say, um, this is an example where you're seeing the very strong cooperative working between county and district officers and the um, environmental health colleagues in East Lee Borough have been working closely with us to make sure that we've got a very, very strong monitoring arrangement uh, to make sure that that fair sticks to its promises about the management of its own controls and safe processes. And I've no doubt at all that the issue of fund fairs nationally will remain an issue in terms of the consistent application of decision making, which we will have to see evolve, I am sure, as we go forward. Moving briefly, if I may, Leader, and I'm going to cut, cut across an awful lot of ground here very quickly and happy to take questions when, when I finish speaking. Um, the report talks about the work within adult social care. Um, it's vital that we don't forget the work that goes on in the care of the vulnerable, not just older people, but of course older people within the care sector, uh, and particularly the very strong partnership working that's going on between the County Council and the private voluntary and independent care sector, uh, which has been put under such duress, but is working well with us, and particularly because we found ways to facilitate the transfer of the government's infection control grant to that sector to make their work easier. And I think that work continues to go unabated and remains a very, very strong level of risk to our staff in terms of they, the way that they're working in the community. And, and truly, that's the group of staff that deserve a huge amount of credit for the way in which they have been working. In children's services, the report talks about referral rates for children on the social care side. We have experienced a surge in referrals, which have put enormous pressure upon uh, our services and are reflected within the report to a degree, which is to do with universal services coming back on track and us identifying children who've been involved in lockdown. That is continuing, but I am very pleased to report, Leader, only on the latest data this very day, that that surge seems to be coming under control now. And although we're still above uh, uh, annualised averages for this work, we're nowhere near as high above those averages as we were over recent weeks. Within children's services still, Lydia, you've mentioned the schools issue. I do think everybody involved, including the colleagues within the County Council, but particularly the schools community, deserve great credit for the way in which they've worked flexibly to, to open the do doors to schools and to make sure that they're working. And as you pointed to, Lida, there's a higher level of school attendance in Hampshire than the national average, and that's to everybody's credit. Um, and I do think also, I would say, I think points to the quality of the working relationship over time between the County Council and the Hampshire family of schools, schools of all types. Within that, there's been a massive challenge about organising very great changes to the home to school transport system to support school attendance. Uh, that has been done against the wire, but has been done effectively. But I'm bound to pay reference to the very serious and regrettable incident of a school crash, a school bus crash. Uh, which we know is subject to review at the moment. Within ETE, there is work going on around highways, um, and, and that is rolling out and improving rapidly. And also the situation with regard to the, the Hampshire Waste and Re Recycling Centres is moving forward apace. Uh, with response to Councillor House's comments, I would simply ask that if, if he wants to refer to me or to Stuart Jarvis, with any specific examples where he thinks there's project delays which may not be due to COVID and where 
certainly we would never want to hide behind the excuse of COVID, then we'd welcome those specific examples and we'll work closely with him to find what those issues um, might be. In CCBS, uh, again, those, our services are up and running, but it must be noted, and Carolyn Williamson will talk to this in the financial report, we are still facing a significant loss of income, which has an, an impact upon our general capacity, and much of that income sits within CCBS. Great work is going on within the registration services to make uh, to keep pace with national changes, particularly, obviously, around some of the challenges for the community for weddings and funerals. Uh, and also our oversight of the coroner's service for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight is coming into its own. And what is well, less well known is that CCBS, on behalf of the local authority, leads on our accommodation strategy. And that, too, is moving quickly. It is having to respond to the changes in central government direction about the pace with which we uh, return to whatever the future normal might be. And finally, Leader, if I may, uh, before picking up on one more point from Councillor House, um, I, I would want to make reference to the work of our resources services and our communication services who are working gainfully to try to make sure that everything stays on the road, particularly payments, invoices and the like, which is such a significant dimension of the county's economy, uh, and the communications to MPs, politicians and the public about what is happening, how, where and why. I do recognise, going back to Councillor House's point about phone lines, uh, that that has been a challenge, but respectfully I'd suggest that the work of the County Council is much more complicated than the average district, with no disrespect to those districts, and actually we have had a very, very secure strategic approach to access to our services through phone lines, through online and through mail, which has ensured that although the main phone lines have not been operating as they used to, um, access to uh, services remains on track and we can brief in more detail about that um, as we go forward. Uh, the final point I would want to make, and again reflecting upon Councillor House's comments, and I know your own as well, Leader, is I would like to pay tribute to our staff for the work they've done throughout this. We've, done, we've said this before, we'll have to say it again regrettably, it is, as this report points out, a very long crisis, uh, but the staff of the County Council remain very, very committed to their work for the local authority and their community, and that's been a huge dimension of our success, such as it is in managing the situation. I'm sorry for the length of the report and the introduction, Leader. I'm very happy to take questions and comments. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, now, can I turn to my Cabinet colleagues? Have, any, uh, have anybody got any comments on the report or particular aspects of it? Uh, I, I, if I didn't make it clearer earlier, I just would like to reiterate what the Chief Executive said about our support for all the work under very trying times that our team in the county amongst the county council staff overall are doing and continue to do it's very much appreciated not only by us but i'm certain by people right across hampshire that we're still operating despite the difficulties running a highly efficient service of public um, uh, amenities for people generally uh councillor reed a microphone steve Right, I'll start again. Thank you, Leader. Uh, and thank you to the Chief Executive, not only for the report, but also that um, very helpful introduction. Um, it's difficult to ask a question about something which is basically happening now, but uh, I'm wondering if the Chief Executive has picked up that there are potentially tests becoming available with a 30 minute response that could be mass produced and made available. Uh, the reason that I'm asking this is that I fear that doing this on a rules-based basis is becoming increasingly complicated and we're getting increasing pushback from the general public. Um, doing it on a factual basis that people can get tested and know within half an hour the decisions that they need to make might be a way of managing our way through a very difficult winter and I was wondering if the officers have yet had chance to look into that or what the engagement plan might be. Uh, John, do you want to comment on that? Um, I'll, I'll try to briefly. I think the central comment is to say that um, whereas all options for increasing testing are welcomed and vitally important, the scale issue is the critical one about upscaling the amount of testing within the community. And we've heard talk of the government's uh, ambitions for a, a, a moonshot approach to testing, which will 
far accelerate the level of testing at the moment. And my understanding is that some of the schemes that have come forward about local results, including uh, very fast results, are working at this stage on a much, much lower scale than we're going to need now and into the future. I would reiterate, if I may, Leader, given the opportunity of Councillor Reid's comments, which I do understand, but the fundamental issue nationally is about lab capacity keeping pace with local testing. And we're having our local testing capacity capped by the absence of lab capacity. Uh, we're nationally in discussions with uh, and regionally discussions about this. That's the critical factor, particularly as the upscaling of testing goes forward in future months in the way that the government hopes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, 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 Councillor Grajewski. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, I, I make no apology for saying what I think I've said at just about every meeting I've been to in the last few months. Um, and I'm, I'd like to draw members' attention to paragraph um, 18, um, which talks about the importance of social distancing. Um, there are a lot of things that we can all do um, residents out there in the community which are quite easy to do which will hopefully help prevent what Councillor House described as I think I've got it here um, moving inexorably in that direction referring to um, the situation that there is up north moving south however um, I think we also need to uh, uh, not be lulled into a false sense of security by what we see on the news about the situation in the north of the country. Um, it is not a problem up north. It is also a problem down here. Our numbers are low, very low. The report talks about an infection rate of four per hundred thousand. Of course, things have changed since the report was written and we've heard from the chief executive it's now 10. Um, so it's still very low, but the virus is out there. It's among us. So we really must um, keep our distance, wash our hands. I mean, isn't that just the easiest thing to do? Um, and, um, and, and wear masks where we want to. And in terms of the, the, the guidance, um, you know, there are limits on what we can do. And some people find them more difficult than, than others. But I would also stress that they are limits. They are not targets. And I think, uh, yeah, everybody has to take responsibility um, for, for what they're doing and uh, weigh up the, uh, the the risks as we do when we cross a road. Um, so um, I just really wanted to, to, to make that point that um, about the simple steps that we can all take um, to prevent the spread of the virus. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, uh, Councillor Fairhurst. just like to draw attention to paragraph 28 which John alluded to about Woodcock Lodge and the fact that we're actually got other in-house provision in other parts of the county now to take people out of hospital I think it's a great strength of Hampshire's that actually we have got our own in-house provision um, a lot of upper tier authorities divested themselves of their care homes we still run ours and this enables us to take people out of hospital, start the rehabilitation, but keep them safe and secure for enough time to ensure that there's no suggestion of onward transmission of the virus into other care homes or into their own home settings. And I think that's a great strength and not to be underestimated compared to the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, you make a really good point there because the, we know about the problems in the spring about the infection rates and being brought into care homes, positive um, te uh, people testing positive or were positive without being tested, uh, are having quite a devastating effect on care homes generally across the country and, of course, in Hampshire. And that mechanism, I think, should help the NHS prepare for any second wave without having a repeat of what happened in the spring taking uh, patients out of acute hospitals into uh, 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 facilities where they can isolate away from the rest of the community, uh, re-enable in the process so that they are free of the virus when they move either home or to uh, a care home or a nursing home. So I think that's a very important point. Um, are there any other points about this particular item, item six? If not, 
are you all happy with the recommendations in powers two, three, and four? If you're not, put your hand up. If you don't put your hand up, I presume that you're in agreement. I can see no hands. So we will move on to item seven. And once again, I'll ask uh, Councillor House if he would like to start the ball rolling on behalf of the Liberal Democrat opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And can I just reflect, because the, the, these, two, these two reports, the last one and this one, are, are of course inextricably linked uh, because it is the effect of COVID uh, in, in its ongoing capacity to cause damage to our finances uh, that, that, that affects this report. And the comments that were made by cabinet members in the last report, and indeed the chief executives, I thought were really helpful. And Judith's comments about uh, about uh, the potential for infection is, is got to be absolutely right. Um, we have to recall that the only reason we have the pandemic in this country is because probably a relatively small number of people imported it, whether it be by boat, by plane, by train or by car, uh, and it was contact uh, that created this this pandemic uh, and it still has the potential to cause uh, massive distress uh, uh, as well as illness and death alongside all the financial issues that we're discussing here. I, I sense, Chairman, that the, the discussion that we had earlier in the summer when we were still talking about uh, the commitment that the government had made to reimburse local government, um, at that point was quite topical with government. My sense is that government has now moved on and local government, and I'm saying this collectively, it's not a comment necessarily about this county council, but it's about local government as a sector, is now struggling to make its case to government in terms of financial reimbursement. If you recall, the context was that we were told that all our costs would be reimbursed, and it's now very clear that won't be the case, um, both in terms of ongoing revenue or in terms of our, our, our lost income. Um, and therefore, we have to, to an extent, uh, live with the situation that we are, that we are now in. I was particularly struck by, by this report, as always, and it's, um, I, I feel really sorry for Carolyn and Rob for, for having to write such bleak reports to us, uh, because it must be pretty depressing for them, as well as us in, in reading them, that the, the inexorable trend here, and I'm going to stick with inexorable as, as my word of the day, Chairman, uh, is that we are on a, on a downward slope financially, that government isn't going to bail us out, and the modelling that we've got here in Section G of the report, uh, I still think has got a number of best case scenarios in it. We don't yet know whether we will have a more significant lockdown over the winter uh, as a result of uh, infection rates rising and the effect that will have for us as an organisation, both in terms of increased costs over and above those which are shown in this report, as well as lost income over and above which is shown within this report. Uh, and so I think we just have to collectively as a sector, and again, I'm not making this comment specifically about Hampshire County Council, it's true across local government as a whole, continue to make the case uh, to our members of parliament in particular uh, that local government is the engine of recovery, that local government is the engine of dealing with the virus alongside our health service, and we do need proper financial support uh, if we're to tackle this, vir this virus and pandemic effectively and then move forward eventually uh, into recovery. And we're not there yet. So this report, as always, has made bleak reading. Uh, I suspect, if anything, it is worse than uh, we're being told here because the implications of negative change could be worse th than is here, and we need, therefore, to be even more cautious about how we move forward. Uh, I don't think that I don't think there can be any answers. I've no noted the report doesn't suggest any answers this time uh, because we we do have to wait for government. Uh, but the critical point is to continue to make the case to government. I know that you're doing that, Chairman. I'm sure that other cabinet members are with the contacts they got with their members of parliament and others. But we need to redouble that effort because the peril that faces us is a continuing decline of really essential local services that matter to all our residents, uh, wherever we are in the county, uh, regardless of which type of local authority uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about the service provision for. Thank, thank you, Councillor House. Uh, we don't always agree, as one would expect, but on this particular point, we are in agreement about the need to make certain that government realise the central role we have played and have continued to play in actually finding a solution to the pandemic and actually uh, moving out of it economically speaking. Um, and from that point of view, I think I'd say two things. First of all, 
I simply reiterate the point that I've made on a number of occasions in the past, based upon the Treasury model, which indicates 10 years ago, from a standing position, uh, the NHS now receives 30 billion pounds more than they did then, and local government receives 20 billion pounds less. And that latter figure, I think, is shown up in the difficulties we have dealing with crises as they came along, um, simply because we don't have that capacity to deal with unforeseen events in the way that we might have done 10 or 15 years ago. I can assure you that we speak on a regular basis, all cabinet members, particularly myself, with our local MPs, both collectively and individually, to make this point to government. And I know some of them very recently have written back to me or emailed me back, explaining the fact they've made points to, amongst others, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So on that point, could I ask the um, Treasurer, uh, the Head of Resources, uh, Carolyn, would you like to speak to this particular item of, of the financial update? Thank you, Leader, and thank you for those comments. And also, thank you, Councillor House. I, I do agree with the comments that he made. It is a bleak report. Um, it's a factual, and therefore it has to be bleak. As you will all recall, um, in February, when we were setting the current year's budget, um, that was on the back of 10 years of austerity. And we were concerned at that point, pre-COVID, about the financial sustainability of Hampshire County Council over the medium term. We were working on the basis of a one-year central government allocation that was basically a roll forward plus some additionality to support increasing demand with absolutely no indication as to our future um, financial funding. We are now, again, expecting a three-year comprehensive spending review announcement um, in December. But obviously, that is questionable based on the impact of COVID. And we have already been informed that we may end up back with a one-year settlement. Um, obviously, our concern must be that that one-year settlement is being referred to as flat cash. Clearly, flat cash would be a significant issue for the County Council due to the increasing year-on-year -year demand pressures that we have to deal with in the services we provide to our most vulnerable in terms of adults and children's, and therefore flat cash would give us even greater financial concerns. The report you have before you today, though, is not just dealing with those concerns we had at the point of setting the budget. They have been significantly exacerbated by the financial consequences of COVID on our financial position. And that cuts across a number of aspects. The direct costs of response, which we have proceeded to expend on the basis of activity that must be undertaken in order to deal with the crisis that we are currently in. We then have the loss of income, which has been referred to, and in particular that affects um, CCBS, whereby, as any other normal business, um, during lockdown and during restrictions, the income that we had budgeted for has not been forthcoming. And then the other budget impacts, the additional um, pressures that we are having to deal with in terms of demand, and one, for example, that is mentioned within your report is the impact on our coroner service. And then we've also got added to that the delay in our planned savings. As you know, we have a two year program of circa 80 million pounds per annum of expenditure reduction or income increase as part of closing our budget gap. And understandably, in some areas, those savings programmes had to be paused as we were dealing with the crisis and we are still dealing with trying to ensure that they get back on track again. As you can see within the report um, and the last report to both Cabinet and Council dealt with four potential scenarios. I think Council House is absolutely right. Um, we could do many, many more scenarios and they could be um, probably a lot bleaker. I think we did try and come up with the, the potential worst case, but we did not include anything around a second lockdown. 
At the moment, the monthly returns to MHCLG continue and they are required to be on the basis of not having a second lockdown. I strongly suspect that that will change over the coming weeks. In terms of the paper itself, at page 62, you can see the, the table um, in those sections talk about if we were to receive what we think we are due from central government in terms of the direct um, costs of recovery, a contribution towards the loss of income and a contribution towards the reduction in council tax and business rates income of 52.4 million, then in the current year, this will already cost us around 83 million pounds. And those are just the latest figures. They do change month on month. Looking at three year position, it's 210 million. These are significant sums of money for any organisation to try to deal with. And therefore, rest assured, I know everything that can be done is being done through both the officer communications with central government departments, in particular MHCLG and the Treasury. And I know through the political routes to get the point across to central government that we desperately need to be properly funded for these financial consequences. Colleagues, the next steps are that we are currently working on bringing the next report to you, which will be Cabinet and then Council in November and December. That will bring you up to date again with the latest financial position, the latest position in terms of delivering the transformation savings. But hopefully we will have some more information by then about the comprehensive spending review for three years or indeed whether it's a one year um, budget. Colleagues, very happy to take any questions and apologies for such a bleak report, but unfortunately, it's frankly as, as accurate as we can make it in the current circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, questions from my cabinet colleagues. Uh, Councillor Reid, is there anything you want to add to the report? Well, I, I, I want to say how much confidence I have that Carolyn and Rob have produced a comprehensive report and that's it almost in a lead into a, a, a question. Um, we get these reports and we can see what the facts are and they're stark and they're not embellished and so on and the word comprehensive I think is important. Now what worries me is our other councils taking the same approach to producing their reports or are they doing the arithmetic in a different manner because what i don't want is for civil servants somewhere to say oh well, look hampshire have included that but somewhere else hasn't so um, hampshire are over egging the pudding and will go with the lower figures that someone who's done the, the arithmetic differently has come up with if we're going to make the case as local government that uh, we need the help and we need to be reimbursed. We need some consistency across all councils. And I was wondering if Carolyn has uh, any handle on, on whether that is or is not a problem. Carolyn, have you got a comment about that? Oh, I think she's frozen. I think we've lost her for the time being. Well, let's move on and come back to that if we can. Have there, are there any other comments from other members of the cabinet about this report? Okay, um, Carolyn, are you with us? I don't think she is. I suspect, Chairman, she'll be in the process of logging off and logging back in. Yes. Le leader. Yes. If, if it's helpful, it's, a, it's John Coughlin here. I can make a comment. I, I wouldn't yes. be able to do this as, as eloquently as Carolyn or with the same level of qualification. But I, I think Councillor Reid makes a really important point and we're mindful of it. Um, we are trying to make sure that the cabinet here have the clearest analysis of the situation as we face it and we are working gainfully to deal with it. I share his concern that we don't want Hampshire to have its head above the parapets in, a, in an uh, untoward way. But we're also very keen indeed that the government understands the nature of the predicament from a well-run financially secure county council thank you john i think i can probably add steve the fact that i know that there after the spring where 
there were what I would say a lot of different variations of what the financial position was in uh, local councils, depending upon what they'd included in their figures and what they hadn't to central government. And I know Grant Thornton helped uh, the network, the county network, to come up with more consistent figures. But I'm still not convinced that everybody does it quite in the same way. So what we might do, if you're happy, is get um, uh, 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 Carolyn to send a quick note around the cabinet to answer your question as she's perhaps temporarily not with us. So bearing that in mind, are you all happy with... Hello, you back with Leader. us. I am terribly sorry. I seem to have had a problem with the Wi-Fi. So if you would like me just to quickly answer Councillor yes, Reid, I can reassure you that the MHCLG returns that we um, have to provide on a monthly basis are very prescriptive and require us all to provide the same information in the same format to ensure that we have um, provided them with absolute comparability across the various sectors of local government. Added to that, we do review and discuss very carefully across the county, district, um, unitary and met sectors to make sure that, again, we are being as consistent as possible in order to, to help MHCLG and Treasury to be completely clear on the financial consequences. Thank you and terribly sorry for my Wi-Fi. Don't worry. Um, you're not alone in having occasional problems with the Wi-Fi. Um, OK, fine. If we've got no more questions and no more comments, are you, do you approve the recommendations in para three, four and five of this item? Uh, same rules as before. If you don't like the recommendations, put your hand up. And if you do like them, just don't do anything. OK, I can see no hands up. So those recommendations are approved and we move on. So the next item, item eight, adult health and care, year two strategy progress. Obviously, this is not directly related to the COVID-19. We've covered some of the health and care uh, 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 items associated with the pandemic. This is really more focused on how our plans for the savings that we decided upon before the uh, pandemic are actually mapping out. Uh, and um, uh, 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 Graham Allen, do you want to give us a rundown on how things are going? And then I'll ask my cabinet colleagues, including cabinet, uh, Councillor Fairhurst, to comment. Yes, of course, and, and good morning. Um, so this provides an over She was received and approved by cabinet. Uh, Graham, you're very weak. You might try switching off your video just to see if we can get the sound alone. I hope you can. So the report reports of a range of achievements in the financial year 2019-20, which can be seen in paragraphs 24 to 35 of the report. The report also points to priorities in this year and indeed future years, all of which will see impacts from COVID-19. And these are shown in paragraphs 36 to 42. However, the overarching priorities we've previously identified are proving to stand the test of these very fast moving times. In summary, those priorities are supporting people to access a range of uh, assets within their local communities without the need for formal social care support. Secondly, to focus upon supporting people to live in their own homes with formal support and hopefully enjoy the maximum amount of independence. And thirdly, continuing to pursue opportunities for a range of accommodation-based support through the development of extra care, supported living and other accommodation-based support models, including discharge to assess, which was referred to earlier by Councillor Fairhurst. In conclusion, despite the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19, our services and our response, in line with our departmental strategy, remain strong. We continue to remain agile as we go forward and remain focused upon the outcomes and the strategy to provide our residents with the best and most appropriate support. 
whether that be through our public health services, our social care provision, and through our engagement with partners across all our communities. I would just say, and it's repeating to some degree what's already been said, that the effort of staff within the department in all areas, but also with partners across all agencies, are proving uh, to be incredibly uh, reliable and robust in terms of being able to support residents. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Graham. I should have actually introduced you for the record as the Director of Adult Services. I think we probably caught about 99% of what you said. The uh, actual quality of the transmission wasn't brilliant, but I think we we managed to understand exactly what you were saying to us. Uh, Councillor Fairhurst. Thank you, Leader. I, as you would expect, I fully endorse this report by um, Graham. But I, I would like to just say to, to, to anyone listening that all the measures we're taking to affect savings, um, independent living, um, supported living for younger adults, extra care, the prevention agenda, all actually work to the benefit of residents. So what we're doing is we are trying to enhance their quality of life, their ability to live a proper life, and at the same time affect savings. Um, it's not just a question of making savings for the sake of making savings. We're actually doing what we can to improve people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, any comments from other members of the Cabinet? Are you all happy with the recommendations then at para two, little a, b, c and d? I see no hands up and therefore those recommendations are approved. Moving on, climate change. Um, Stuart Jarvis, the Director of Economy, Transport and in, in the Environment, do you want to start the ball rolling on this one or are you going to hand straight over to Chitra? Uh, Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to hand straight over to Chitra on this, this item, please. Fine, thank you. Chitra, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so just want to run through the report and I'll try and make some responses as well to some of the deputations while I go through the report. So the purpose of the report is to present to Cabinet the action plan for 2020 to 2025 uh, to outline the new strategic framework that we've set out um, looking at the new key areas to support delivery of climate change targets set by the Council to present to Cabinet the two decision-making tools for approval on assessing the impacts of decisions on carbon emissions and to outline how those tools will be used and a little bit about monitoring and reporting. So in July, we presented to the County Council our strategy and at the time we also did present the action plan, which represents the significant amount of activity being taken, taken place across the Council. Um, it is important to note that a lot of that activity is about embedding climate change into everything that we do. And although um, it is significant, it doesn't get us far enough to reaching our targets, which is why we've come back in um, to Cabinet this time with the framework for strategic programmes. So as set out in July, we've been working with the Carbon Trust to establish our baseline emissions and also, also to establish our five yearly carbon budgets. So you'll note that both the strategy and the action plan only go up to 2025. And the reason for this is to make sure that we are flexible and adaptable and that we can respond to opportunities as they arise. So it's really important that you know the action plan and the framework are only up to 2025, but acknowledging that these are the sort of milestones towards 2050. So we've been working with the Carbon Trust alongside key partners to understand how far the pipeline of projects that set out in the action plan in July would take us to meeting our targets. Now, there's obviously recognition that we haven't put next to it emissions for each of those actions. Um, to actually do that would require a significant amount of action and resource, which um, would not actually be that fruitful. Um, it is quite a complicated process for a lot of the actions to be able to assess emissions and you know we, we did some work beforehand and reviewed a lot of other action plans and actually very few local authority action plans are able to do that because it's just very complicated. 
But what we will be doing is assessing the carbon emissions alongside the strategic framework, which I will cover uh, later on today. So part of developing that strategic framework was the engagement process. So we had a workshop with the Climate Change Board. We also sent out a survey um, to a number of external stakeholders as set out in paragraph 18, and we had quite interesting responses from that. And we also had an expert stakeholder engagement event on the 6th of August, which we've heard about in the deputations. I think it's just worth mentioning at this stage that we have not dismissed the um, proposals within those uh, responses. We're very much keen to kind of see how we can take those forward and embed them into the work that's taking place across the organization. However, we have to be realistic about the resources that we have and the prioritization of those actions. So we have asked in many cases to send, the, to send those specific actions off to the relevant services for them to review and to work out whether they can include it within the work that they're doing and to prioritize it. So by no means was that um, us dismissing it. It was very much about us saying that we need to put more time and effort into reviewing those proposals and seeing how they sit within the 2020 to 25 um, action plan that we already have. So the new strategic framework covers um, all of these strategic priorities as set out in the strategy, and so does the action plan. So both the action plan and the strategic framework are completely structured around the strategy. And when I mean what I mean by these strategic priorities, are those are the key sectors: so transport, residential, building infrastructure, energy generation, distribution, waste, circular economy, natural environment, and business and green. So we continuously kind of link back to the strategy to make that clear. And as I said in, in the report, it's also stated that the strategic framework and the action plan will be combined after cabinet to make one coherent action plan. So they don't, they're not kind of separate. Um, so the from paragraph 34 onwards on page 87, I just set out what the strategic framework is there to deliver. You'll see that the framework sets out key projects um, and programs against each of the strategic priorities. We're actually still working with the Carbon Trust on this, and we will be providing emissions um, projections for each of those programs where we can. So we are working with them to do that. Uh, again, you know, this is quite a complicated piece of work and an ongoing process, and we're very much at the beginning of that. But we do recognize that we do need to have emissions targets to be able to say that we're going to meet our own targets. Um, so we are working to do that with the Carbon Trust and that will be the final framework that we kind of publish on the website um, uh, after that work is complete. So given the complexity and magnitude of the programmes that are being set forward, it's really important that the Council takes a robust approach on how we will plan and deliver these alongside all of the other major priorities that we have responsibility over. And we also need to recognize our financial situation. It's been discussed a lot already this morning in terms of where we are with COVID. Um, and this, what we would like to do is make sure that we're very much setting forward what we think we can achieve and what we think we can deliver, but also within the context that um, we have major dependencies on national government funding and national government policy before we can actually deliver a lot of these actions. So what we are trying to do is make sure that we are prepared for when policies change or when funding becomes available to move quickly and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, as it's stated in paragraph 42 under finance, a lot of the programs within the strategic framework will require significant resources to deliver, which is not really within the possibility of our own budgets. Um, and obviously this has been reinforced by the financial impact of COVID. Um, but as I said, we're working really hard to make sure that we're prepared to move quickly if those funds become available and also to do a lot of the groundwork, which is also really important. So as I stated, the um, framework will be integrated into the action plan and the action plan will then be monitored on an annual basis um, and that we are reporting for the first time to Cabinet in October next year. And also just to quickly state that all of the information will be held on the website to make sure that you know all of that is um, available to everyone. And the website will be consistently uh, updated to keep all the information fresh because the action plan is a live document. This is a, a kind of capture of it in a moment in time and we'll continue to work on it and develop it. And finally, um, on page uh, 88 just to go through the decision making tools. We are developing these tools again in collaboration with the Carbon Trust and this is about being able to be transparent um, about our reporting on our key decisions and to assess the carbon emissions and resilient impacts of all of our significant decisions. 
So the objective is very much for these tools to be used at the beginning of the project initiation stage and build in climate change right from the start. And I think this is a bit of a key theme for us is a lot of what we're trying to achieve with the work we're doing now is to make sure that climate change is at the heart of everything that we do, because that is how we are going to meet our targets. Obviously, the strategic framework programs are very significant and are above those actions, but very important that the County Council really embeds climate change into everything, and that's kind of what the tools are there to support. Again, I think it's worth mentioning that the tools are not going to be the answer to everything. Unfortunately, they're quite complex, they're quite innovative. Um, I don't think many other local authorities are doing something like this. So it's very much, again, the beginning of a process. And what we really want is to use these tools as a way of raising awareness and giving officers um, grounding and understanding on how they can assess the impact of climate change on what they're doing and how they can take account of it. So this is going to be a learning process for us, which is why we are proposing that the rollout is piloted initially within the environment department for the key decision days. And we will hopefully iron out any issues and then we will roll it out for the rest of the organization in April 2021. Um, so we really want to make sure that these tools are fit for purpose and that they are um, used in a way to start a project as opposed to the end of a project where we can't really change what we're already set out to do. So that will take time because obviously a lot of projects are already underway. So this is about sort of not doing a retrospective check, but really trying to kind of look forward in the future of what we want to do as a county council and really embed climate change into anything. I think it's also just quickly worth mentioning that the tools um, are the, we have an intellectual property agreement with the Carbon Trust, so we cannot publish the tools publicly um, because of the way they've, they've been designed. Uh, they contain information that's only relevant to the County Council and what we don't want is other authorities to pick this up and use it and then say that there are mistakes in it, which obviously that, you know, it wouldn't work for all other authorities. So that's why the tools themselves have not been published alongside the papers today. Um, I think it is worth mentioning that those tools really demonstrate our leadership and innovation and forward thinking. And as I said previously, this is very much a start of the process. So just in conclusion, to reiterate, the Climate Change Action Plan is a key milestone for the County Council and the new strategic framework really sets out a significant step change for the authorities' approach to climate change. And as I said, we will definitely be doing the carbon emissions alongside that in the coming weeks. Uh, just to highlight the target date for 2050, that we will remain with the 2050 target date, um, which is the national government target, and also you know, recommended by the Committee on Climate Change. However, any opportunity to accelerate that we will take, um, and we will continuously review, which is again why the action plan and the strategy only go up to 2025. And also worth noting that the first 10 years as stated in some of the deputations being critical, we agree and we want to do as much as possible, but we are heavily dependent on national government funding and given some of the sort of uh, financial um, implications of COVID on the whole country, there's no guarantee that those um, funding or policy changes will be forthcoming. So it is a difficult 10 years ahead and we have to recognise that and we have to be realistic about what we can achieve. Again, just to reiterate that the County Council's focus is on countywide programmes and initiatives for the whole county area. So we have to work across all the district and borough areas to try and develop consistent approaches and maximise opportunities for economies of scale. Uh, and then briefly, just to say that we recognise that the County Council has um, a leadership role and a catalyst role in tackling the wider emissions, but we will not be successful unless individuals, community groups accept the challenge too. And we're really happy to hear that WINAC and HCAN are keen to support us. And we feel that they have a really important role to play in using their expertise, networks and engagements to support what we're doing and deliver actions alongside us. And finally, I just want to make a, a correction to page 145, appendix three. Um, the two actions related to the pension fund, they should say pension fund panel, not full council in the, the final column. So that's just a minor amendment that we'll make going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chitra, for that very thorough uh, uh, brief on the um, this particular agenda item. I think the two things that come out of this are one, that we want to put ourselves in the best possible position to actually um, uh, 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 be able to bid for funding from central government 
when it becomes available, because it's clear from the Prime Minister downwards, the environment is something that the government, despite the pandemic, are very keen on pursuing. So that's really important in its own right. And really, just to reiterate one of the points you made towards the end, and that is that the real thing that we have to do is to encourage other people outside the council to follow the same path, both in the public and the private sector, because that's one way or the only way we really get the admissions down <clears throat> in our own county. And in that context, and addressing particularly the two deputies, I think your role, apart from quite rightly trying to persuade us to do more, which we fully understand, is to go out there and persuade particularly the private sector to take a more sustainable way of operating their particular business model. And I think in that area, we will, we are already beginning to see quite a sea change. I look quite regularly at what the big oil petro companies are doing. And it's very clear, and an example this morning in the case of Shell, are really changing their strategic direction because they're looking beyond the reliance upon the company's success on petrochemicals and looking at other ways in which they can use the profits they've made from petrochemicals to look at a more sustainable way of us all operating. Now, in this context, I'll now hand over to Rob Humby, who is has overall responsibility for ETE, and then Jan Warwick, who is responsible directly for the environment to the executive and to cabinet members. So Rob, first of all, um, over to you. Chairman, thank you very much. And can I first of all say huge thank you to uh, Chitra. I think if we had given Chitra a, a, an hour to present that report, um, it would still be difficult to have done it justice. No, justice. And I'd like to thank her and her team. You clearly see her enthusiasm and commitment to the climate change and for the enormous amount of work they've done in a relatively short space of time. So just a general thank you and, and, and huge congratulations to the, to the team for doing that. So as you say, Chairman, I'll just make a few uh, comments and then hand over to Councillor Warwick, who's leading on this. So I think overall, climate change is a huge and ongoing challenge. And we must be adaptable and agile in our response if we are able to be effective. For this reason, both the strategy and action plan are set out in the initial five-year time horizon, and Chitra has explained that, so this is a, a live document, an ongoing review. So this will allow us to review our strategy and make sure it remains fit for purpose, and that we are not missing opportunities as we move into each new five-year action plan period. The new framework and strategic programmes being presented today sets out a clear and significant strategic programme to help us meet our enormously challenging targets of moving Hampshire as a whole net zero to a whole net zero carbon and greater resilience to climate change impacts. This will require leadership, leadership by this council, working closely with our district and borough colleagues, local town and parish councils, and other key partners and communities, including the many groups committed to tackling climate change and improve the environment. And indeed, uh, Chairman, you mentioned uh, deputations earlier by Anne and Sarah. I just want to uh, make, make that point that it is about collaboration and working in partnership. And we are listening, and as Chitra has explained, there's still a lot of uh, work to do. So we are, the framework identifies the key parts of the County Council that will lead this work. We will lead this work through the Economy, Transport and Environment Department, and we will be taking on a key role uh, coordinating this. The next steps of the framework will be to consider how County Council can progress these areas of activity and to identify the operational and delivery challenges and opportunities, and not least amongst these, as the, as the critical financially challenging time, which we've heard earlier, um, for local government with the, with the external and government funding uh, opportunities that we might see. Two decision-making tools are also being presented to Cabinet today, and these tools will provide a clear and robust and transparent way of assessing how our projects, policies, initiatives contribute towards these climate change targets. These tools represent a truly innovative approach by Hampshire County Council and demonstrate our commitment to responding to climate change effectively, transparently and coherently. 
It is going to take time and effort and embed these tools fully and effectively within the county council's decision making processes and, and projects and policy initiation process. And for this reason, the rollout would be piloted initially with executive member decision day reports within the economy, transport and environment department from October the 1st this year, with the assessment becoming mandatory for the whole council for the beginning of the next financial year, so from April 2021. And I think that's important, an important chairman, because that addresses some of the points that the deputies made about adopting it today or not. We are going to be looking at this initially as a pilot, as I've said through there, and then roll out through the whole council. It's a live document, as we say, and they're still learning and understanding to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I okay with you, I'd like to hand over now to Councillor Warwick. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Rob. Um, Councillor Warwick, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. I'm extremely pleased to see this report being presented to Cabinet today. We now have a coherent strategy, an extensive action plan and a strategic framework for the carbon gaps we've already identified. Together, these three components will deliver a comprehensive response alongside our communications and engagement activities. We noted back in July at Cabinet that wider community engagement is key to delivering this strategy. So I'm delighted to update you therefore on the Climate Change Expert Consultative Forum webinar we held on the 6th of August. The purpose of this particular event was to bring together the relevant professionals, the academics and the community representatives from a range of organisations right across Hampshire who could advise on the development and the delivery of this action plan. Over 60 delegates from across 45 Hampshire organisations, including HCAN and WINAC, attended the event, which comprised of expert presentations on the development of the strategy to date and workshops, which provided the opportunity for delegates to highlight what they believe the County Council, Council should prioritise and identify if anything had already been missed. In fact, this event was such a positive experience. I'd be really pleased if we could run a similar webinar event along the same lines for our parish and town councils too. Over 200 suggestions came forward from this event. They range from domestic energy to advice on transport to changes in our planning law requirements. And these were put forward by delegates from across the two workshop sessions we held. These, these information and these suggestions will be overwhelmingly valuable to the County Council's work as we move forwards. And I would like to thank these groups again for their input so far. Since the event, we've started to review and respond to each suggestion. And these have been reflected in the updated action plan in Appendix 3 of the report before us today. Furthermore, to ensure our communities have the opportunity to continue to input into our work, we are developing a much smaller expert stakeholder forum. I will chair this group and it will bring us together the experts to advise the council regularly on the activities, provide challenge and expert insight on this live strategy. Leader, if I may, I would like to close by praising the extensive work by our new climate change team. You can see this from the evidence before you in the detailed action plan and the framework of strategic programmes. Thanks to our partnership with the Carbon Trust, we can now also measure and account for our carbon footprint, from the very small things to the much larger strategic decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Warwick. Um, now I leave it open to my cabinet colleagues for any comments they, they want to make on these this very important item in terms of the environment. Uh, Councillor Reid. Thank, thank you, Leader. I've got uh, two, two points and a request. Um, the first one is that um, this report is extremely important and I think it's being well received. And if I may be so bold, it's enabled Anne and uh, Sarah, who contributed earlier on, to position themselves as our critical friends rather than as people cajoling us to take the uh, subject seriously. So I think that's a good engagement and they won't agree with everything that is in it and they will wish for more. But I think having them as critical friends is going to be extremely 
valuable uh, and it's an achievement. Um, the second point is that I, I just wanted to highlight that this is an action plan 2020 to 25, not to 50. And the important thing there is that that makes this a living document, not a report that's going to be dusted off in 2050 to see how we did. Uh, this is going to be something which is under constant review, and so it should be. So I think that is extremely important. The request I wanted to make, and it is to Chitra if she gets the opportunity to speak again. I was delighted to see in recommendation in paragraph five, little two, the carbon hierarchy as key to our approach, avoid, replace, so avoid, reduce, replace, offset. For those who don't have the report in front of them who might be watching this, it might be useful just to expand a little, and I wonder if Chitra could, on how avoid, reduce, replace and offset are brought to bear as our strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. Um, other comments? Got any other comments? I think there is something I need to do about the... Uh, the message that's just sent through. Chitra, would you like to comment on the note you've just sent me? Uh, yeah, those were just uh, some speaking notes, uh, Councillor Manns, Chairman. Um, but I can reply to Councillor Reid if that's helpful as well. Yes. The um, hierarchy. So, yes, the hierarchy is one of the guiding principles of the strategy. Um, and what we are going to try and do is prioritise the, the way in which that um, hierarchy is set out. So I guess if we're looking at some of the significant actions within the programme, it is very much about reduce, avoid, replace and less about offsetting. But ultimately, offsetting will have to play its part right at the end. So when I think some of the graphs that we put forward in the previous Cabinet report shows you how we would reduce those emissions and at some point there will always be a residual amount and that's where the sort of offset will start to play its role and i think it's just a, a bit like the waste hierarchy it is very much about prioritizing the need to remove fossil fuels um, from the way that we live and the way that we operate as a priority rather than trying to offset as a priority because obviously that would be very challenging to be able to offset Hampshire's emissions within Hampshire's area. The, you know, offsetting is, is quite a difficult thing to do. So that's that's the um, carbon hierarchy and that's why it's so important. I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much, Chitra. Um, fine, okay, if there are no other comments. Chairman, I have my hand raised. Oh, did you? Sorry, Andrew, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I make no apologies for uh, both either sim simplicity or a degree of repetition here. But I would personally wish to uh, add my appreciation for what I think is uh, an exemplary and professional approach that has been taken here, most particularly by, uh, by the officer team, but also by the support from fellow cabinet members and indeed Councillor uh, Warwick, who's, who's led on this. I think it has been absolutely outstanding so far uh, and, and long may it continue. But picking up on the points that both uh, Anne and Sarah have made, I think it's important to emphasise that the plan, or indeed a framework, the, the terms are broadly interchangeable in the context of this, will never actually be complete. And it's they won't be complete because they are dynamic and evolving. The others have made this point, and I think we can't stop emphasising it. And the characteristic which has actually come through all of this is actually the agility with, uh, with which uh, the, the team has acted in addressing the various issues as they have come up. It will not be complete, but what we do want to do is to basically embed this whole approach, frankly, in the DNA of our community. And that brings me to a, a, what I think is essentially a challenge, not just for us, but for the community as a whole, because it is not just the county council, it is not just the districts and boroughs, it is our entire community and it is the country and it is the entire planet. So we are acting as a catalyst, but we do not have the power to deliver as a whole. And we just have to carry that message as far and wide as we possibly can, is that this is vitally important for the future of us all. Thank you, Chairman. 
Andrew, that, that's very kind of you to say that. That sort of really leads into the one extra item I was going to add to, not to the recommendations, but just as an announcement. We are, in the context that you've been speaking, we've agreed to purchase what are called zero carbon electricity certificates, renewable energy guarantee of origin certificates. They're, that's the, uh, the name of them. Um, this, this is a way, this contract has the provision of purchasing fully renewable electricity from sustainable generation sources to reduce council's carbon use. The option for purchasing green electricity, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this indicates the fact that if you do it in this way, you can guarantee that the particular source of the energy is coming from a renewable source. And that is just one example of something that we're doing which undoubtedly can be passed on to others locally in our county to do the same thing. And we are acting, as you rightly say, as someone that is encouraging a more sustainable way of going about our activities. So that's just one small example of how we're moving forward from the general theory to the action plan of actually specifically doing something and showing, if you like, a quick win and early success. I just like to end before we actually agree these uh, recommendations, if we do, of course, um, uh, uh, giving you a, a, a rather off piece comment. And that is some years ago, um, the German general election threw up, as it often does, a coalition. And this was the first time that the Green Party came into office in any substantive way in a Western democracy. And immediately, the Green Party in Germany virtually split between fundamental environmentalists and realists, fundamentals and realists. And I think this is an important point to me, make because I've always been in the realist camp where you want to actually try to persuade the wider community in a positive way to contribute to what you're trying to do to make the whole community more sustainable. The fundamentalists are quite often the people whose hearts are in the right place, but they tend to be quite aggressive in the way they want people to do things. And quite often, dare I say, it's slightly unrealistic. What you want is to try to do things that encourage people to say, yes, we're going to change our policies, rather than driving them into a, a position where they're going to uh, uh, resist any change at all. So in that context, I think what we are doing is we're trying to set a framework in the county to persuade people to adopt more sustainable policies right across the field of activity that they're involved in. And I think we've made a really good start with the way we've gone about things in a typically Hampshire County Council thorough fashion rather than a knee-jerk response to a particular issue. So with those remarks, and I thank you, particularly Tritia, for your contribution to this discussion. Um, I would like us to um, have a look at the uh, recommendations and approve them. And they are at paragraph five recommendations, little one, little two, little three, little four and little five. Anyone against? So I take that as you're all approving the recommendations set out in paragraph five. Thank you all very much. Let us now move on. And we move on to item 10, changes in the planning system, which is not unrelated to the last topic that we've just been discussing. And to start with, uh, once again, and I understand for the last time this morning, I'd like to ask Councillor House for his contribution. Thank you very much, Chairman. And this is a, a really good and detailed paper on some quite complex issues around changes to the planning system and its implications for Hampshire and I'd like to compliment the the team led by Stuart Jarvis that that have put this together. Uh, we could probably spend an entire meeting uh, just dealing with this paper and its consequences. Uh, I'll just pick on four paragraphs for some comments if I if I may chairman. Uh, first in paragraph eight uh, and the role of local planning authorities in delivery where I would actually somewhat challenge the premise of the paper here because local planning authorities are also local housing authorities they do have a responsibility not just to issue planning permissions, uh, but to ensure delivery of housing as well. If they don't, they'll fail their housing delivery test set out by government. 
and they can do so in a variety of ways. They can do so by, uh, by working with landowners and developers where there are blockages on delivery of sites. They can work by direct delivery, by site acquisition if necessary, and direct commissioning of new homes. And they certainly can uh, tackle the nitrates problem if they're in the south of the county, uh, either through land acquisition or through arrangements with neighbouring areas. Uh, and I think that those authorities that have decided to pull the shutters up as a result of nitrates are probably setting themselves up for some difficulty in terms of meeting housing need and passing the government's housing delivery test in the future. Th there are quite a lot of changes proposed uh, from, from government that are referred to in the paper, and I wanted to pick up on paragraph uh, 17 uh, with some of the fundamental changes that are suggested uh, and to broadly agree with the conclusions that Stuart Jarvis and the team uh, reach. Firstly, the infrastructure levy, um, uh, on the basis that it funds, develop, well, it funds community contributions after homes are occupied, uh, is clearly very difficult. Um, uh, there could well be some market distortions created as a result of that, and there's certainly an awful lot of uncertainty uh, and make it a lot harder for local authorities, uh, particularly those that are uh, less well financially endowed than many are in Hampshire, uh, to deliver infrastructure early rather than late. The infrastructure levy could be a real problem, and the abolition of Section 106 uh, very much fits into that area too. The paper talks about the duty to cooperate, but doesn't really come to a conclusion. And I'd like to suggest that Hampshire's response should be that we encourage the retention of the duty to cooperate. The idea that local authorities should work with their neighbours is, in broad principle, a sound one. Uh, certainly for, certainly no, no local planning authority is an island unto itself in terms of its local economy, in the same way that no county is an island unto itself in terms of its local economy. We do need to work with our neighbours. The duty to cooperate may not have worked as well as the government would have liked it to, but it has helped and it has encouraged, and I think we should be trying to retain it. Paragraph 21 of the report talks about four specific changes uh, to uh, the planning regime. Uh, I want to just pick up on three of those very briefly, Chairman. Uh, firstly, the changes to the standard methods for assessing local housing need. Uh, I think that it's quite right that government will want to set out a national target for the total number of homes that it believes need to be delivered for any period of time. The challenge is how you actually then disperse that number across all local authorities. And we get into the devil of detail and disputes as soon as we do that. I think this summer has proved that algorithms don't always work terribly successfully. Uh, and the idea of an algorithm here, uh, which has tended to suggest that areas of high growth and high density, like our cities, require less housing, and areas that have got real planning constraints, but which in theory are easy to develop, uh, like places like the New Forest, actually that's not the case at all. Uh, so a different approach is needed. And I'd like to suggest uh, that we dust stuff, dust off some old history. For 40 years, the Southeast had the Southeast Regional Planning Conference. It worked on the basis that the government set a number for the region to deliver. But then the region, through collaboration and a duty to cooperate, actually worked out how that could be disaggregated and how you get infrastructure planning to work. SIRPLAN and its successors, including the Regional Planning Committee uh, that Jonathan Glenn and I were on for many years, worked pretty well in that regard. It got slightly muddled uh, when the government of the day with Mr Brown decided that it was going to uh, put all sorts of economic constraints on it. Uh, but in principle, it did work. And some degree of local government taking ownership of housing delivery feels to me to be much better. The suggestion of lifting the small sites threshold on developers for the provision of affordable housing I think is a, a very retrograde step. Most sites in most local authority areas are for sites of less than 50 units. So removing the threshold, even on a temporary basis, will seriously undermine affordable housing supply just at a time when with a rise in unemployment and underemployment, the need for affordable housing will, will rise dramatically. And a consequence of this policy right now will be that with the rise in affordable housing demand that can't be met, there'll be a consequent rise in benefit and homelessness claims. So I think there are some real difficulties with some of the changes that the government's proposing there. Paragraph uh, 39, uh, I thought was was really interesting paragraph, uh, with its table of contributions that had come to the County Council uh, under the SIL arrangements. And I was quite shocked and surprised by some of the contents. Uh, I, I've always taken the view that local authorities should be trying to collaborate. Uh, my own district decided not to adopt the SIL route and decided to stick with Section 106 and has handed over millions of pounds uh, to Hampshire County Council uh, for the construction of schools and roads and all sorts of other lovely things. Uh, so I was really shocked to find that some districts, and I won't mention Fairham or haven't, 
uh, I really won't mention them, um, uh, decided not to contribute any of their sill income uh, for Hampshire's infrastructure. So clearly the arrangements for sill don't work at the moment because they don't fund necessary county infrastructure. And county infrastructure does matter. We need schools. We need roads. We need libraries, even if Sean wants to close them. They really are important. So I think some reform in that area really is important and we need to be pressing for it to happen. My, my overarching comment, Chairman, on, on the government's proposals, and I hope that we could reflect some of this in, in our response, is that history has shown that every time a government comes along with a big package of planning changes, what actually happens is uncertainty is brought into the housing market, is brought into the infrastructure delivery market. That delays things from happening and has the reverse effect from which government wants. Government wants housing supply to speed up, planning changes, almost inexorably, I'm using inexorably again, almost inexorably mean uh, that developers pause, reflect, delay their business planning, and therefore don't get on with housing supply. That's not in Hampshire's best interest. So a little bit of caution in taking forward planning changes is in the best interest of our county. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor House. Um, I'm certain that uh, Stuart Jarvis and his team have taken into account a number of things you've said, because I do agree that a number of them were actually quite constructive. Uh, I always worry a bit when, as you rightly point out, a new methodology is used to calculate housing numbers, because however good or bad it might be, if it means, as it does in this case, quite radical changes in numbers, when we all know that numbers are really difficult in the first place. It just adds an extra complication. So I've always argued that when governments want to make radical changes, you, you, you should at least acknowledge the position on the ground and do it in a more gradual way so people can cope with the changes without actually throwing everything up in the air and starting again. Um, I hope that we can work with all our districts and boroughs to give a fairly unified response to government on the different matters that they put before us. From my own point of view, one particular item, as I was disappointed wasn't in the report, was a, some sort of mandate from central government that all planning approvals should contain a need for fibre optic cable to the front door of all new houses. I know there are occasions when that's impossible, but to give more authority to local planning authorities to insist upon that when planning applications are brought before them, will, will, I think, be a very useful tool to encourage all developers to actually look at this seriously and to ensure that particular, what I would regard as in, in increasingly an essential service along line, as alongside electricity and gas to be provided to the front door of people's houses. Anyway, can I ask Stuart Jarvis Thank you, Tim. just to- Thank you, uh, can I ask Stuart Jarvis just to comment generally on the report and then I'll ask Rob Humby to comment from the Cabinet and then we'll take any other questions. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman, and um, I will keep my comments brief because I think Councillor House has highlighted a number of the most important aspects of the report already more eloquently than I could. Um, so the paper deals with kind of three main areas. The first one is the planning reform, and, and Chairman, as you rightly said, and Councillor House um, referred to this, there are sort of two consultation documents out at the moment. Um, the planning for the future white paper, which is m probably fair to describe as a more blue skies document about planning reform. Um, the consultation period for that runs to the end of October, and at the moment we're in the process of trying to formulate a, an overall response to that and pick up some of the wider issues, including, Chairman, the comment about um, digital connectivity, which um, we made in a response this week mm. to DCMS and MHCLG about kind of issues holding back digital connectivity. So I think it's right that that should also go into the the, the comments that we make on the white paper in due course. And um, Cancer has also referred to the changes to the current planning system document, and in particular the, the, the um, housing formula, which does appear to have had the perverse effect of pushing the distribution of new housing development in Hampshire more firmly into rural areas and some urban ones, while other um, kind of major urban areas like Southampton and Portsmouth, for example, would see their numbers cut. Um, and, and there is a question, therefore, about how that 
serves an agenda around urban focus and brand field first and, and other national planning system objectives, um, which I think should be challenged. Um, the paper um, does envisage, Chairman, um, delegation of responsibility to sign off the final response to the planning white paper and the changes to the current system and to yourself in consultation with the deputy leader. And it's hoped that um, we will be able to formulate um, very quickly now the, uh, a draft report for you to look at following the discussion at Cabinet today to enable us to pick up any further points in that discussion for the changes to the current system um, response. Um, the paper also gives an update on major developments across Hampshire, Chairman, and I won't dwell on this, but it not only talks about some of the major developments which are currently underway in the county, and including, for example, Forley Waterside, where there's a resolution to grant planning permission um, recently for the major development at the old power station, and um, also Wellborn, which is the subject of a different item later on. But again, there's been a resolution by Fair and Borough Council to grant consent there, subject to legal agreements, and many down, um, uh, which again, Chairman, I know you're familiar with, where again, there's been a resolution by Basingstoke and to grant planning consent there, subject to legal agreements and, and so on. So three, just three examples of major developments in Hampshire coming forward. Um, there's a lot going on. It's a very busy time. And the report also highlights some other parts of the county where there are big decisions to be taken about the future, probably as part of a local plan right, review process in due course, uh, notwithstanding the potential impact that the white paper may have on the, the future local plan regime. Um, and that, that sort of about Basingstoke, Winchester, through uh, just two examples of areas where potential major development decisions need to be taken in the future. Um, however, the, uh, and, and Chairman, the report does also give a very brief outline about the nationally uh, important infrastructure projects and the planning regime that applies to those. Um, and I know uh, members will be interested to follow, I'm sure, the Aquind proposal, um, which is currently the, the inquiry into that is currently open and both Portsmouth City Council and the County Council, along with, with our colleagues that haven't borough uh, uh, giving evidence and participating in that inquiry. Um, the main purpose uh, in the report, though, Chairman, was to highlight the developer funding regime and the opportunity that now exists for the County Council to take advantage of the relaxation of restrictions on Section 106 to effectively return to the policy as it previously was and actually the one that's worked very successfully as Councillor has outlined in Eastley where we rely on Section 106 agreements to secure contributions from development to um, actually help mitigate the, the impact of that development and section 106 has worked very successfully for us um, in the past temporarily constrained by the pooling restrictions which particularly were, were a problem when it came to um, accumulate the cumulative impacts of small developments but the pooling restrictions have been lifted and notwithstanding the proposals that governments have suggested for getting rid of section 106 and still and replacing it with a national infrastructure levy, the report still recommends that in the meantime, the County Council should revert back to Section 106 rather than still as the primary route to secure development funding um, and suggests a policy and, a, and recommends a, a sort of overall policy approach to ensure that we can do that as successfully as possible, um, working with our friends and colleagues in the district planning authorities. And even if that system is swept away by the white paper reforms eventually, uh, it, there will still be a couple of years at least within which we, it's important that we secure the right level of developer contributions and to ensure that we can provide the school, the transport and the other facilities to help support new developments across the county. And Chairman, um, with, with that, I, that brings me to the end of my introduction. Keith, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. My turn. Yeah, I'm going to call you in a minute, Rob. I just want to draw your attention to something that's been brought to my attention. It's only a minor change in Para 32. It's been pointed out that it says St John Moore Barracks when it should say Sir John Moore Barracks. As some of you who are military historians will note, the barracks is named after the commander of 
Allied forces in the Peninsula War, when I think he defended the uh, route into Portugal before uh, uh, the Duke of Wellington came along and took over. I think I'm right in saying that St. St. John Moore would be someone completely different who I'm not even familiar with. Okay. Uh, my, my apologies, Chairman. I think the planning system reforms were starting about the same time. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Anyway, I just I saw because I saw that on my chat. I thought I'd better say it before. I forgot. Uh, Councillor Humvee. Yeah, Chairman, thank you. And again, uh, thanks to Stuart Jarvis and the team for this report. I think Councillor House mentioned that uh, another very large report and a bit like the climate change paper they could have been uh, single, single agenda items I think on the scale and the importance of them. I'd like to make a few points um, just also to say that Councillor House has raised a few of the points I was going to make but I'll just run through a few points uh, if that's okay Mr Chairman. Um, like anything in planning reform it, it, it's essential that the planning system ensures that development of which there is a lot planned in Hampshire delivers adequate and timely infrastructure to mitigate the impacts of additional housing, in particular on local services and facilities, and you've mentioned those, Chairman, such as roads, transport uh, services and schools, and indeed you mentioned about the broadband uh, issues as well. To date, the community infrastructure levy has not served the people of Hampshire well, as the House mentioned this, um, as the table on para uh, 39 on page 171 shows, that very little sale money has been passed to the county council by the districts since the section 106 funding was restricted and the new seal system introduced it is therefore really important that we utilize the relaxation of the section 106 restrictions to the full and return to securing developer funding for local schools transport leisure services to set off the impacts of development the government are now consulting on changing develop and, uh, developer funding further, but in the meantime, we must ensure local communities do not get sold short by development in terms of, of developer funding, but their share of additional works and, and, and those services. As always, Mr Chairman, planning reform is always a controversial issue, and I think like many of us, we've come to dread hearing the opening comments that reform is going to simplify and improve the system. Um, many of us have been councillors for a long time and I think it's our experience that that very rarely happens in practice. So while I think the intentions are commendable, I fear that proposals may well fall short of the uh, stated ambitions, especially in respect of local community input and engagement uh, with the process, which as we all know is critical and, and very important. And indeed, the capacity of district councils to deliver new local plans, uh, plans across the, 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 the country in the very short time scales envisaged and that is going to put pressure on us all as well i think what troubles me a little bit is the, the headlines have mostly been caught by the planning for future white paper and there are some radical zoning ideas and blue sky thinking which, you know in the planning system which which should all be considered However, in the meantime, the consultation on the changes to the current planning system has gone mainly under the radar. But this is a very important set of proposals that could be introduced immediately after the consultation closes on October the 1st. Um, Councillor House made reference to the algorithms, and I think I've mentioned this before. And we've had some interesting debates recently, haven't we, over, um, uh, over algorithms and how they work, and about sort of predicted outcomes. So we've seen that in Appendix 2 on 183, and we need to fully understand those, and I do have some concerns over that. How, so, relative, how can it be uh, sensible or good planning to increase housing requirements by 50% plus in largely rural areas like East Ant, Test Valley and Winchester, while reducing them by 20% in the city of Southampton and the largest Hampshire towns of Basingstoke. Some large urban areas like Haven have seen huge increases, while others like Fairham have seen numbers significantly cut. So there is no logical planning rationale for this, least of all an urban focus and prioritisation on brownfield land development. And we've seen that come up many times before. Unfortunately, as we said, we mentioned earlier about algorithms, there is no teacher's assessment here to fall back on. And, and if we see that the formula 
potentially is producing flawed results. Unless the local planning authority are allowed, as they are present, to plan taking account of local circumstances, as well as a housing formula. And I think, Leader, you, you mentioned that as well. But on a more positive note, the report also talks about major developments happening in Hampshire. And I'm really pleased to note that the County Council has played a, a key role in most of these, including the, the Thorley, the power station, which you mentioned earlier, the water side, which will come up later on the agenda, and, uh, and many down in Bader State. It's a huge programme that the County Council is involved with. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, I've got two hands up, as far as I can see. Um, Councillor Woodward. Yeah, th thank you very much, Chairman. I just want to make a few points on this and obviously have uh, some interest as uh, any other district councillor colleague would have, uh, being a member of a district council as well. Uh, I did agree with very much of what Keith House had to say until he, I suppose, strayed a bit off piece towards the end and started talking about libraries and, and uh, who was giving what in terms of SIL. Probably just to say a little bit in terms of SIL, what um, Keith may not be aware of, of course, because it's not his own authority, but what uh, has actually happened in fairness by lifting education and roads out of SIL, that meant that we could just do in fairness Section 106 agreements and pass the money over to the County Council as, as normal, because SIL does not produce enough money to do what is needed, and therefore what has happened in Fairham, and I'm sure one or two other districts too, is to maximise the Section 106 take so that we can get the money for what it's needed for and the total amount of the money that's needed rather than just some of it. In terms of duty to cooperate, I think that would be a sad loss if that disappears. It's something that in South Hampshire we've practised now for the best part of 20 years through the Partnership for South Hampshire, which works extremely well, and it means when local plans go off to be inspected and examined that the box which is always ticked straight away is duty to cooperate absolutely unquestioned councils cooperate with each other and so though the principle of subsidiarity always applies and uh, nobody tries to usurp the powers of a local planning authority but uh, issues are dealt with as close as they can be to home and uh, arrangements can be entered into to make sure that the area gets what it needs, satisfies the housing requirements, but most importantly, those housing requirements are decided by the local by the local planning authorities themselves. In terms of the new methodology, uh, certainly it's it's had different effects on on different councils. The the lobbying I did very very consistently of government was to say that the latest population household formation statistics are the ones that council should be allowed to use because the government was simply cherry picking and saying well the 2014 figures give the biggest housing need so therefore you've got to use the 2014 uh, figures plus an add-on fudge factor talking about affordability. Uh, now we are able to use the most recent household requirement figures from the ONS and I think that's really positive but I think then where, where things have got slightly odd, and this is the, the algorithm that uh, Councillor Humby was talking about, you've then got, well, what is the greater? Is it your household need for 2018 in, in this case? And obviously when the figures are through, it will be 2020. Or another funny little figure, half a percent of your housing stock, and, you know, and whichever is the greater. And I think that's where some councils have been hit when that bit of the algorithm has been added. So rather than talking about the real data, what how many homes are needed over the next um, 15 or 20 years, as opposed to how many houses have you got already? And that seems a very strange way to determine. So I'm happy with the recommendations over here, Chairman. Uh, and uh, But I do think that certain tables like table one and civil contributions need to be taken which are, with a bit of a pinch of salt unless you're going to describe the entire circumstances behind them, which is for what do districts collect SIL or what do they use Section 106 for? Some districts only use Section 106, others use it mostly, and uh, some perhaps don't use it very much at all, and then they don't get much anywhere in SIL, and then of course the, the total amount then passed across to the County Council through SIL is rather less than the real figures, which are those that come through Section 106. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Um, 
Councillor Heron. Chairman, thank you. I, I will be brief and I certainly am not going to go. Th You're on boot mute. You've just gone mute. Sorry, Chairman, I don't know what you've got about the health start again. Uh, Chairman, I, I'm not going to try and go through all my concerns with these two consultations. We would be here for a, another day. Um, I think perhaps, uh, like Councillor Wood, would start with saying, obviously, I do have an interest as a member of a district council, and perhaps I also have another personal interest as I work as a planning consultant. Um, Chairman, I want to just focus down on a couple of points in each of one. I think the, the issues with the changes to the standards methodology uh, in the imminent consultation changes to the current system have been well addressed and I share those concerns, particularly the impact on rural areas. Uh, I do want to come back to, to, to the issue of affordable housing to just say, Chairman, I am at a loss to understand how in challenging times uh, you help the most vulnerable by reducing the delivery of affordable housing. I, I cannot see a logic behind the move from 10 to 40 or 50 units before affordable housing becomes required. I don't believe that it will speed up the delivery of housing. I merely feel that we will increase the profitability of some larger developers at the expense of some of the most vulnerable in Hampshire. Chair, I do just want to say a couple of things on the uh, consultation on planning for the future and I think one I, I will just pick up with is, is to do with the infrastructure levy. Um, as has been alluded in, in the table of contributions there are certain areas of our uh, county where there are very specific individual circumstances so example in the new forest all of the sill money that is received currently goes towards habitat mitigation um, we are all aware of the nitrates issue and the fact that specific sill requirements will be required for uh, offsetting uh, nitrates. And I do have a concern with a national infrastructure levy. One on the fact that we have some areas of Hampshire where we have higher sill charging schedules because developers are able to pay more money. We have others where we wish to promote growth and renewal and we would have lower charging schedules. And secondly, I am at a loss how that would then tie in to, for example, contributions that be required under habitats regulation. So we could see in parts of the county, large, if not all proportions of that national money being taken up, not to deliver those infrastructure and objectives that our communities need, but to meet obligations that we would have used 106 money for. Chairman, I'm not going to go on to discuss about zoning and or to explain that every time that the government has simplified the planning system, the only people who have seemed to come out very well out of it were planning consultants. I fully support the recommendations within this report. Uh, thank you, Councillor Heron. Councillor Reid. Yes, that, thank you, Leader. Um, paragraph 16 was the one that caught my eye for uh, a couple of reasons. Um, let me say, as it's been developed, uh, it's been discussed, I don't like the algorithm-based approach either. Um, I don't think we should be steering the ship by looking at the wake. I think we should actually decide wh where it is that we want to go and uh, then have planning and development policies that uh, meet that. But having said that, I was delighted to see in paragraph 16 that there is going to be some requirement placed on developers uh, under permitted development rights. Um, we have in Basingstoke, for example, uh, a, a huge tower block which has got 300 apartments in it. And I, I am, it's my belief that they did not have to make any contribution towards the schooling of any children that might live there or the roads uh, for the traffic that might be generated because it was a conversion of an office block, a tower block, uh, in, into residential. And I think that was a, a glaring hole in planning policy. And I'm very pleased that permitted development rights are likely to have to make their contribution uh, to um, uh, the requirements that they place on society for the education of children and on transport. I'm also very dubious about allowing developers to pay retrospectively for um, the um, contributions that they're going to make uh, we had the example when I was in Basingstoke Northwest and Rooksdown was being developed of a developer having to make a payment after, say, House 100. And he got very quickly up to 99. 
but the the, the hundredth home, which was going to be expensive for him, seemed to take forever. So I think that the, um, payments should be made in advance and that infrastructure should be provided in advance wherever that is possible. So those are my comments and uh, I hope they might get uh, built in. Thank you, Councillor Reid. I agree with both the last two comments you were making. Um, I think it's important. I often feel that the infrastructure needs are not as accurately predicted and looked after at the beginning of a development. Um, and that is when people get quite fed up, when they find the roads, the roads aren't made up properly, or indeed that the primary school is over, over committed. I'm glad to say that particularly in terms of schools in Hampshire, we do try to stay ahead of the demand. Um, and I think we've achieved that over a number of years now. But nonetheless, I do worry about the idea that the money only comes at the end of the project rather than the beginning of things like that. OK, I can't see any more hands hands up. So uh, um, are you all in agreement with the recommendations at Para 1, A, B, C and D? Anyone against? OK, thank you very much. They're approved. I'm uh, moving on rapidly. Waterside vision. I think you're in the chair again, Stuart, aren't you? I, I am chairman. Yes, uh, my apologies. You're going to be hearing a little bit, uh, a, a lot of reports from me this morning. But on this one, I can be very brief in the introduction because I know members are pretty familiar with the, uh, the background to this. Um, a lot of developments happening at the water side. There are some very ambitious plans for more development to happen. It was felt important for the three local authorities to come together and set out a statement of ambition for the area, Chairman, particularly in the context of central government looking at the sort of reviews of the planning system, comprehensive spending review and everything, because it's it, the, the one, uh, one thing I think that everyone would agree on is that development at the water side would be good, but it will need some significant infrastructure improvement to support that um, and I know that recently there's been a lot of discussion about reopening the railway line for passengers but also about the fundamental need to improve the A326 at the waterside and this report seeks cabinet's agreement to a, a common vision statement between New Forest National Park Authority, our colleagues at New Forest District Council and Hampshire County Council and seeks authority to authorise you chairman to sign the document on behalf of the County Council. Thank you, Stuart. Does anyone want to speak on this item? Councillor Heron. Chairman, I'll say a few very brief words in, in welcoming this, and, and I'd like to sort of draw people's attention, if I may, to page 206, which is the socio-economic profile of the water side, because I think sometimes people don't recognise that development has a purpose. It has a social purpose. Uh, it's to provide homes, it's to provide work. But actually, part of this key strategy is recognising that whereas the New Forest is seen as a, an affluent, beautiful place to live, and it certainly is a, a beautiful place to live, it has its challenges. And uh, through levering the right kind of development, through ensuring that you have those facilities and that joined up thinking that this joint working between the county, the district and the national park does, it delivers real positive outcomes for people's lives and uh, I, I would commend this document to, to, to fellow cabinet members and I, I think that through this joint working we will genuinely ensure the sustainability, the growth and most importantly the improvement to people's lives within this key part of our county. Thank you Edward. Uh, Councillor Humby. Yeah it's just to pick up on a few points on that and also on, on, on what Stuart Jarvis said I think it highlights, and even on the previous report, Chairman, about the importance of the infrastructure. And Stuart has mentioned the A3, uh, A326. Taking all those on all those points that Edward has said, I think what we need to make sure is um, is that you know planning for infrastructure sh should run alongside planning for development, not as an afterthought after the development has been planned. And that cuts right across everything that we do, and goes back to the points that you made earlier. Um, you, yourself and I, Chairman, have been down to the waterside and had a look at some of the impressive work or plans that are being proposed. So very much support the paper, and I think it's very timely on the points that Stuart Jarvis made about not only the road but the railway as well. So very much support the recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to speak? Okay. 
uh, you, uh, you, do you all support the recommendations? Please put your hands up if you don't. Right, I approve the recommendations. We approve the recommendations at para two and para three, which takes us on to the last item on the agenda. And once again, uh, Stuart, Stuart Jarvis, Director of ETE, over to you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, again, another very topical um, report um, at the moment, and I know a number of us um, took part in an interesting telephone discussion with MPs that, just last night about the importance of securing funding for this important development. Um, very briefly, background to this. The, the, this uh, Junction 10 improvement is um, it related to the Wellborn Garden Village development that Council Woodward, um, uh, as leader of Fairham, has, has sort of led on and um, is very much an important part of Fairham's future planning. Um, and the development can't be realised without um, a significant improvement to the motorway junction. The County Council took on the role of scheme promoter for the motorway junction at the request or in response to a request from Chris Grayling um, at the time he was Secretary of State for Transport. And we progressed with the design of the new motorway junction um, during, that, uh, during the period since then. Um, the reason for this report coming before Cabinet today, Chairman, is primarily about funding, and, it's, and there are two dimensions to the funding issues. One is the funding to build the motorway junction in the future, and a recent decision by Solent Let to reallocate um, funding from the junction to other local priorities uh, to avoid that funding being lost to the local area uh, has had the consequence that we now have a significant funding gap um, on the motorway junction for delivery and that's an issue but perhaps more urgently and the report speaks to this chairman we are also due um, by the end of this month to run out of development funding to pay the county council to actually do the work on progressing the design um, of the motorway junction um, we have since the paper was written received um, further confirmation the paper referred to an offer from Solent Lep on the 15th of September um, to provide up to £900,000 to help to fund that design work up to the next logical stage of the process which we are confident could be completed in time for the spending um, programme for that money i.e. March 2021. Um, on Friday night, we received uh, the first um, draft funding agreement from the LEP, and my colleagues in legal and finance teams have been working extremely hard over the last 24 hours to look through that agreement to um, there are over 50 conditions attached to the offer of finance, um, including some which potentially create obligations which I think may not be acceptable to the County Council. Um, that was the fear. The, the initial analysis, I think, Chairman, uh, we're reasonably optimistic, but there will need to be some changes to those um, uh, grant conditions in order for us to be able to sign them, but we think they're relatively straightforward and therefore hopefully there won't be a problem with that. Um, but nevertheless, that, that, that is, um, I think, an important caveat for the County Council because our long-standing policy has been to respond to the Secretary of State's invitation but not to do so, uh, uh, not to put County Council resources um, at, at risk or, or be committed in the project other than those things being paid for as part of the overall process. Um, so the report basically, Chairman, seeks uh, Cabinet's authority for us to take the appropriate action if development funding isn't confirmed. And I say I'm, I'm optimistic that it will now be confirmed subject to tweaking the draft finance agreement with the Solent Let, but I hope they'll be responsive to that and I'm sure we can secure that. Um, but it also seeks a cabinet's agreement that we should review our permission at, uh, position as formal scheme promoter when we get to stage three of the highways uh, England process, which is effectively signing off the design, the preliminary design, 
before you progress to the next stage, which then is the making of um, side road orders and other statutory legal processes. And I think it's right and appropriate that the County Council should review its role as scheme promoter when we get to the end of the stage three approval process. Um, and that's uh, the purpose of the recommendations before you today. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Stuart, just so I got it clear in my mind. So if we are happy after checking all the caveats that the 900,000 has been given to us with the appropriate, um, uh, 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 well, with, with the appropriate guarantees of the way we can use it. Does that mean um, recommendation of paragraph four and recommendation of paragraph five no, no longer apply but the recommendation of paragraph six would still apply. Have I got that right? Um, do you have, Chairman? I, and my advice would be that given that the Cabinet meeting is today, that it would be prudent to consider all of the recommendations. Oh, yes. But they wouldn't be taken up in the event yeah, that we that, are able to reach that, agreement. That, that's my point. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm happy, from my own point of view, uh, subject to what uh, Councillor Woodward may say next, that all three would still go ahead. But what I was thinking of is that underneath my name, which I think I can do with the signature, uh, add that particular point, which effectively says uh, recommendations four to five would only apply if agreement hadn't been reached between us and the Sodent LEP for the uh, 900,000 to be used. Does that sound that about right? That, 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 that now, does not change the recommendations, but make it clear yeah, um, that, that, that it wouldn't apply in the event yeah. that we are able to reach agreement, which, which I'm optimistic we could. It's all about definitions. That's the yeah. issue, as it often is in legal agreements. Councillor Woodward. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Chairman, and i um, grateful to Stuart for the introduction that he's given here. As, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, what I would do is uh, make my comments, see if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask me in my uh, role in which I've declared a personal interest as the leader of Fair and Borough Council and then depart. Uh, so I, I think the the report, when I read it first, I thought, well, this is all a bit uh, pessimistic. Uh, but of course, it was written, I, I understand, in the circumstances before the Sodom Net had uh, made a recommendation and made a decision to produce an additional £900,000. It was probably very optimistic at the very start to think that the Department for Transport money, so that let money, uh, would be able to be defrayed within the period up to the end of March 2021. As this report says, this is if the County Council sees this through in terms of not only promoting it but delivering it, this is the biggest capital scheme that Hampshire County Council has ever seen, ever been involved in by by some margin. So I think that puts it in a in a helpful perspective. But it is, of course, important that all of the work does continue to be done, because I do know that if an operation, the size of which is involved in putting together this design and business case, were to be ceased even temporarily to then gather all the troops back together again, you know, if we've been marching them up the hill and we've marched them back down to even find them, let alone start marching them up again, I think would be a, a huge challenge. So I think I think this is the right way forward. I'm glad that the LEP has come up with the remainder of the cash that can be spent within the appropriate period. Uh, where Wellborn is at the moment, the planning consent was resolved to be granted. We'll be singing its first birthday, happy birthday next month to that planning consent. And very shortly, we would expect to see the developers in a position to be able to sign the Section 106 agreements so things can proceed. But there is one critical pre-commencement condition, even when they've got the planning permission in their hands and can wave it around, that pre-commencement condition, which has always been Fair and Borough Council's view on Wellborn and mine personally, that not a brick of Wellborn should be made until all of the infrastructure is identified and we know where the money is coming from. So that means that in terms of the biggest piece of infrastructure, this £75 million pound motorway junction, of which £5 million has already been spent in terms of the design and, and business case that the County Council has worked upon, 
uh, that that funding needs to be found. And of course, with the LEP money becoming in the LEP's view, time expired, does mean that that money needs to be found again. And we are very hopeful that the HIF money, housing infrastructure funding money, uh, which the government has made an offer of, which is grant to Ferran Borough Council, uh, will be able to fill that gap uh, with the developers in terms of being able to say that that junction is now fully funded. So that is work that's still underway, but I now feel this is a positive way forward. Now the additional money has been found. Uh, so I, I would uh, be urging the uh, cabinet to support the recommendations with the caveat chairman that you said to make it clear you know, this is only a sort of if needed and if the 50 multifarious conditions that are emanated from the solar let uh, for some reason were not found acceptable but I'm sure with a will and discussion that they will be and the case will continue to a, a satisfactory conclusion. Uh, so if anyone does have any queries for me and my role that I've declared the interest on, I'll obviously have to try and answer them. Otherwise, I shall leave you and view you from elsewhere. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, Rob, is, there, uh, has, uh, is this a question to Sean? No, it's not a question for uh, okay. Sean. If the comments are cabinet. Yeah, OK. Well, should, let's deal with any questions. Have, has anyone got any questions for uh, Sean? Because if you haven't, and I can't see any hands going up, um, you may depart and watch as a Thank member you. of the public. I will. Uh, <laughs> and um, we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Rob. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to make the comment, and I know things have moved on a little bit, and indeed in even last night, but we've consistently ha had a position where we have um, always wanted to support and help advance the scheme. From day one, we said that. That's what we tried to do as, as the County Council. But we always made it very clear that we couldn't contribute financially. But what I will say is, Stuart and the team, we've had endless conversations about trying to secure the funding at every time this, that we run, you know, the money runs out to do that. They've had to work extremely hard to secure that funding. And it has sometimes barriers have been put in our way by several organisations, if I can put it like that. And it, I, I think we ought to just note. And I know Sean is now you know, saying that he's happy with the recommendations, but it, and he thought it was a negative. It's never been negative, but I think we must stress the point, and all Cabinet members and everybody be aware, how hard we have had to work to continually get the funding put in place to, 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 to forward the project, if you like. So it's not something that the county has done to, to hold it up or, or at any point whatsoever. We've always tried to promote it and support it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rob. Well, you know, I'm on record as saying we've gone the extra mile um, in terms of our commitment to this project from the word go. I think we've done more than, than we needed to, um, to make uh, in making that commitment. And I think we the, the, the recommendations and the caveat that I've suggested, I think are exactly the right way forward because it shows that we're still keen that this takes place but it's got to be made clear that the promoter of the scheme is not going to be us and that the funding has to be in place where it would be through the let let through the department of transport through other parts of central government i personally believe that this way of actually trying to get the funding together for a major infrastructure project doesn't work very well. There's just too many people who have to get their own um, a, a position protected from their own point of view. And it's really difficult when you've got people with different positions, different timescales, different sets of criteria to all agree on this particular project, uh, project such as this. And that's where I think it really gets very complicated indeed. Um, I just noticed, is there someone else who's got their hand up? Ah, Councillor Stallard.
thank you, Leader. I just wanted to extend my sincere thanks to um, Stuart Jarvis and his team for all the hard work that they've done, because my county council division actually bank, uh, backs onto the border of this particular uh, motorway junction. And we are going to be very much affected by the influence of the well-born development. Um, so with all the hard work that you've done behind the scenes in securing uh, success as far as we've got today, and it is looking extremely hopeful, um, we are very, very dependent upon the efforts that you put in. Now, I say we, I'm talking about the people who live in my particular division, because it will make a tremendous difference to their lives. And that motorway junction has to be completed, as, as Councillor um, Woodward said. That motorway junction has to be completed before development can, um, can proceed at Wellborn. So an extended thanks from me personally, but I also know from many of the local residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. OK, are there any other contributions? Keith, if I just may very quickly, it's uh, Rob again, um, in terms of also noting the, the letters that you have sent to ministers and indeed the Prime Minister as well, and the number of visits that we had previously to talk and lobby ministers um, on, on behalf, I suppose, uh, uh, of everybody and, and what Patricia has said to try and secure this funding. So uh, I'm sure it, it should be noted that the work that you've done personally also to try and uh, secure that uh, central government funding. Rob, you're very kind. Yes, um, I'm afraid this junction seems to have lived with me for a number of years in one context or another. OK, is there anyone that doesn't want to see the recommendations go ahead? Right, I take that as approval to the recommendations at paragraph four, five and six. And perhaps, Stuart, a, a form of words that I can put on, uh, underneath or before my signature or however we do it, to acknowledge the work that's going on between you and the left to try to sort out the extra 900,000. OK, thank you all very much. That's the end of probably one of the longest cabinets I've attended, but that just demonstrates that we've had a lot to do. Thank you all for your contributions and the fact that we've managed to get through as much as we have. Thank you. <laughs>